Hi and welcome to the Rini Devotes podcast and our top 10 shows to see in 2024 list. Well, you know, despite being February, I know we're late. Myself, Ben and Jose have convened to tell you what we are most excited about to see this year. David, sadly, couldn't be with us here today, but he has sent us his top 10 shows that will hopefully be edited in seamlessly, depending on how much he's been drinking before he recorded his parts. And like any good top 10 list, there is a metric shit ton of shows that are just going to miss out and you should still definitely check them out anyway. So here's our long list. Long list. Woo! And first up, we have Avatar The Last Airbender coming very soon on Netflix this month. It's generally one of the most famous mangas of all time, I believe, and it definitely was not made into a terrible, mainly American cast adaption by M. Night Shyamalan <laughs> back in 2020. No siree, that definitely did not happen. So, hey, at least this time, they've mo- they've cast a mostly Asian cast to actually represent the story, and each of the eight episodes has a budget of around $15 million. Uh, I know nothing about this, except it's a epic Asian live-action fantasy. So, hopefully, it'll be great. What about you guys? I've heard a little bit of news. Um, I did not watch the manga, so I don't know the characters' names, but um, they're a little concerned. The, the fans are a little concerned because one of the pieces of news that came out was the older brother of one of the characters. In the show, he was apparently... A little bit misogynistic but the arc was he would grow out of it and respect the women in the in the show and they said that they're going to pull back on that a little bit um there's no actual details on terms of what they're going to do with that but a lot of people are like no that's a huge part of the show so uh I, i'm i'm intrigued I'm, I'm really interested to see how they handle that ben you love asian action I do. I love. I love most action. Um, Asian action is always always good fun. Now, I I only know this from that terrible uh, movie that that didn't get made. Um, so, <laughs> like, it, like I love the idea of it. I love the premise of it. I think it's fantastic, and I and I and I respect the source material that I have seen, um, which isn't a lot. Like I said, but all I can really judge it from uh, right now is uh, is how it looks to me, like on the trailers I've seen, and it just looks glorious. Like there's no yeah. like, I don't think they've dropped the ball on uh, on like locations or anything like that, and 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 like really, um, and like you say, having like a like an Asian, mostly Asian cast, like portraying this like highly, uh, like revered manga um, epic is is fantastic. I think it's gonna be great. I mean, I'm a bit hopeful on it. I don't like I say, I don't know. I didn't even see the really bad film that didn't exist back from 200, 2010. Two hundred three. Um, <laughs> but. Netflix have actually got a quite a good reputation in a minute. Like, what was the last big manga they adapted? One Piece. Sir, are you forgetting uh, Cowboy Bebop? I loved Cowboy Bebop. I loved Cowboy Bebop. Bebop. Bring that back. It was fucking excellent. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, boy. We're going to have to talk about Cowboy Bebop at some point. Yeah, we'll that, do that yeah. in a Firefly oh. rant as well. Bring that back, you fucking idiots. But Cowboy Bebop had some controversy with their 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 output. I know, but I, I didn't know the manga, and so I enjoyed the show on its face value, and I really yeah. enjoyed it. I think that's the thing. I think for for a Western audience that hasn't seen it, and I think that's what, hopefully, that's what's going to happen with the Last Airbender. People that haven't seen it and aren't like religiously like um, like addicted to the source material will like it (laughs) as much as the people that the 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 people that love it, you know, as well as they should. So I think that that is going to play into the the show's um, credibility. And so yeah, well, we haven't got long to Avatar: The Last Airbender's out. I think probably about a week before by the time this podcast comes out. Next up, a show that a lot of people are very excited about and that has a mixed reception so far that you've actually seen the first few episodes of, Ben, and that is Mr. and Mrs. I've Smith. actually seen it all now. This, mo- this movie, this um, show was going to be in my top 10 uh, until I actually saw it. Um, right. and, it's, and that's not to say that it's bad. It's just... Mm-hmm. It it definitely wasn't what I expected it to be. Now I'm not going to give you any any like giveaways or anything, mm. and I'm going to be trying brief because we're only on the we're on the long list. But it's um it's not the spy. If you're expecting a spy show, it's not a really a spy show. Um, mm. that could be conceived as, as a spoiler, but it is a spy. But it is a, a show. About so it's spies. more a relationship show than yes, it is a spy it, show. It, it for me, from what I took away from it, it feels more like a relationship show, and that's no bad thing. Um, mm. it's like it's paced very like it it is it's paced very well it's not the pacing that i like however mm. i recognize and i respect it um overall it is a good show it's worth a watch it's definitely worth investing in and i'm interested to see if they do a season two however i did remove it from my mm-hmm. my main list because i'd seen it and i was like ah it's fine it's fine here's what i think of of mr and mrs smith mostly um I think of the Americans with Carrie Russell. Yep. 
and I think of Atlanta because of Donald Glover. And I'm wondering, is it somewhere kind of a combination of the two? Because I feel like you have to have a certain humor for Atlanta. Yes, yes, and no. Uh, Atlanta was, yeah, it had that spe- a specific um, sense, of hu- sense of humor. But I think that the set, the humor in Mr. and Mrs. Smith is a little bit more on the nose, and mm. that were and that works really well. Um, okay. But also, did you know that this is a is a remake of uh, God, oh the it? Brad Pitt Angelina Jolie movie? Mm, well, yes, but also a 1996 original series with scott bacula or bacula i don't know how you say his name no. sir yeah. you do not mess up scott bacula's name bacula thank you very much okay so <laughs> like and, I, and i am a, and i am a huge 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 quantum leap fan i rewatched yes, all of it recently um Ooh. last year and it was we need incredible. to talk about that later we will yeah. uh but uh but yeah it's also there was a, an original so it had scott bacula and uh timothy oliphant and tim what? edmondson in it as well so it's actually wow. I have never yeah, I, I, I just did my research for, for what I thought was going to be my top 10. Look at Ben with the research. I was super excited about it to, to when I found that out. And then I watched it and I was like, nah, it's cool. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> I, I watched the first about half an hour of the first episode and fell asleep. But it wasn't a reflection on the quality. It's just I started it late. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I haven't come back to it yet. Because mm-hmm. I got caught up watching The Lazarus Project that I'd never heard of or seen before. Oh, and then oh, someone on the podcast yeah. talked about it. And I was like, okay, I'm now mainlining this till I finish all seasons of it <laughs> mainlining. Uh, yes mainlining in my eyeballs uh next up on a long list we have uh, a show that i thought might actually make it onto our list and it hasn't and i just don't know whether that's because we haven't all seen it yet i've seen no. the first episode and that is masters of the air spielberg mm. and tom hanks next world war ii project this time focusing on well the air and masters yeah. of it starring <laughs> primarily uh austin butler who still seems to be doing his alvis accent and up-and-coming british actor callum turner with support from uh, Barry Keoghan, who isn't, you know, being disturbing in it this time so far. <laughs> and uh, also, keep the nepotism flowing. It's got Sawyer Spielberg. Hmm. Surely no relation of an actor we've never heard of before there. Oh. And uh, some youngster called Raph Law, Spawn of Jude. That's not his surname. But, well, hey. Law is, but Spawn isn't. Uh, I've actually seen the first episode of this, and it was fine. It was one of those things that like, I enjoyed it. But obviously, I suppose, because it's setting up all these characters in the arcs and all that kind of stuff. I was like... It's kind of a bit, yay, gung ho. We're the, we're here to save the day. A bit too much for me at the start. Right. But I mean, the I war stuff, that. the plane stuff, was really good. But then the rest of it, I was just like, eh, so you, it's you a like bit the cheesy. meow meow bang bang as opposed to the ah <laughs> oh, hooray, yeah, meow meow bang bang. I was a big, big, big fan of that. Um, can I just we we we've referenced it twice now. Sorry, but um, we've both said, or at least two of us have said, that's just fine. That is now officially <laughs> the we needed roads metric for something that is average. Yes. It's like ne- neither good nor bad. It's like middling. That's just fine. And I'd like three to, uh, stars is still a recommendation. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. I, I watched the first episode. I see what they're doing. It's just fine. <laughs> well, I think if it's just fine, we don't need to talk about it anymore. So uh, <laughs> moving on to a show that might not be out this year, but apparently is being filmed now. Brian Hannibal Fuller, not his middle name, but Brian Fuller, the showrunner who did the TV show Hannibal. That's he also did Pushing Daisies. He also did Dead Like Me. Um, he is making a Friday the 13th prequel TV show, which on its own sounds like a terrible idea, right? We're well, not going to have Jason in it. At best, you're going to have his mum in it as like a, a main character, but she probably won't be in it until the end of the series, right? So it just doesn't seem like a good idea, except it's being made in collaboration with A24, and they've got the writer of Scream, Kevin Williamson, on board doing it. And yes. like you say, Fuller's last show, uh, Hannibal, was amazing. So uh, I'm kind of up for this now. I'm like, okay, there's it's going to be definitely some like 70s style camp drama. If they're inventive enough with it, it will be great. And it, yeah. and it only takes a little bit of outside the box thinking to make something like this fantastic. But unfortunately, when studios get involved, A24 are a really good studio, so I don't think they're yeah. really going to meddle. They're not going to do a Warner Brothers and, and insist there's giant metal spiders in there for some reason. Um, <laughs> and that that would be a bit out of place on Friday the 13th, wouldn't it? Uh, well, who knows? Except who knows? for Jason X, Jason goes to space. There you go. Uh, but yeah, no, I think I think you're right there. I think it could be it could be pretty good. Yeah, I think we could be something, you know, the writer of Scream, A24 and Brian Fuller, I think we could be in, something, could be in for something quite special here. Uh, next up, we have, uh, and this is a big if, if it's actually coming out this year, because it was being produced and then it stopped because I realized it was all going terribly wrong. Uh, <laughs> and that is Daredevil Born Again. Yeah. Mm. Now, this is probably one of the few shows I'm really happy that they're delaying, especially the way that it happened with um, Kevin Feige saying, you know what? No, this is not what we're doing. 
Yeah, was that was that like a, a Feige sort of reaction? Like, uh, did he jump or was he pushed? Because um, uh, who's the, is it? Iger, who's now back in charge of Disney. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. he's he came in and he basically put the brakes and everything and said we want to um, concentrate on quality over quantity, right? Let me tell you the story that I heard, and it was all because of the writer strike. And as it turns out, because of the fact that they couldn't create new things, Kevin Feige took the time to kind of look over the episodes and. It turns out that it was more of a lawyer procedural. And he's like, no, no, no. This is not what we're going for. Yeah, I heard that. Um, like they said, he isn't actually in the suit till episode five at the minute. Exactly. And so that was something he didn't like. And so he he literally was like, well, I mean, according to reports, it was him who said no. And then that's where he fired the, ah. the, the writers, fired the director. And then they brought in new people. I think uh, one of the showrunners from... Punisher, the Punisher, yeah, mm. and I love yeah. the Punisher. I the Punisher. Yeah. So, I mean, the Punisher. That's already. I'm really excited how this is going to shift gears now. And what was annoying a lot of fans of the original Netflix Daredevil show was that Eldon Henson and Deborah Ann Wall weren't going to be back in it. Now they're back, so everyone's like, "Yes, you like you actually got the team back together." And this is what people yeah. want. I think, like, I think, I think Deborah Wall was having trouble being cast in other things as well. I remember that like, she was doing like a Dungeons and Dragons thing on. Uh, um on youtube and they some did an interview and they were like you know what projects you got coming up and she was like not a lot because like after daredevil like i got typecast in a way that was like pretty tricky mm -hmm. to move around and you know like it, who like all the all the the um the stuff that i'm going for like is is already given to to like younger actors and blah blah so she was having a really tough time but anyway so getting her back is not only like right for the show it's morally correct as well <laughs> Well, apparently in the original first episodes, they were actually killed off to give Daredevil the motivation, which is like, no. Terrible. Ex yeah, exactly. Terrible. Horrible ideas. Foggy Nelson needs to be alive. Forever. <laughs> yes, forever. Oh, we should actually like we should actually um, um, preface this by saying that Daredevil Born Again is only on this list because it was supposed to be out this year. And we don't want to miss it off just in case it is out this year. But if it's not out this year, we'll deal with it next year. Sorry, yes. Twitterverse. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few shows which are in that space today, to be fair, that we're going to be talking about. Because with the strikes and streamers just panicking, yeah, God knows, man. Yeah. I'm going to remember that rant, and I'm going to say it again later for my list. Nice. <laughs> so uh, next up on the long list, a show that's been on for, God, it feels like almost a decade now, possibly longer. I think and it's longer, yeah. it, if, I think it's longer. And it is uh, Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Um, I love this show, man. I've watched oh, it since day one. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's so good. It's so strong. I think it's I think it's in season fourteen now, and they um, after winning uh, a couple of Emmys cut uh, a few weeks back, um, John Oliver did an interview. I think he went on uh, one of the late night shows and he said uh, the only reason that they haven't been uh, shut down by HBO is that they keep winning awards. <laughs> he was like, honestly, yeah. if it wasn't for the awards they win, that show would have gone a long time ago because it's it constantly bites the hand that feeds. It's like yeah. it's political yes. satire. Uh, I think at, at its finest. I mean, from my point of view, it feels a little bit judgy because it's an English guy telling Americans, how, but like, it, like it telling Americans what's wrong with their country. However, John Oliver has lived there for so long; he is like, you know, full on. He's not. I think he's got an American passport now, and you know, like the Star Spangled Banner. But yeah, he's uh, he's full on American as as far as it's concerned because it's yeah. You know, the U.S. has been a far better country for him um, just in general, and he loves. He, he you can tell on his rants that he that he loves America and that's the reason that he's doing this mm -hmm. because he would love it to be better in places. And to be honest, when he rants, he brings the information with him. He's not just ranting. He's giving you all the details and that's what I love about him. So like I, I constantly want to post his clips to people's pages to be like, mm -hmm. Hey, did you know about this that you, you completely wrong about? But then that would look like an ass. <laughs> I mean, so I, from going back to like the first series, I remember, well, I think it's like the second or third ever episode of it. And he's like, now we're going to be talking about the death penalty. Don't turn off. Here's a video <laughs> of a hamster eating a mini taco. And I'm going to play you that video if you stay with me and come with me on this journey as we talk about the death penalty. Yes. And I love that fact that he uses humor to get you onto a really dark, serious subjects a lot of the time. And oh, stuff yeah. that, like you say, most people aren't aware of. Yeah, he did the expose on FIFA like years before that actually came out and became oh, a big yeah. deal. He did it on WWE and the whole independent contractor thing before that became a big thing recently. You know, he's always ahead of the curve on what 
in his toilet. I mean, like you say, and, and the team of writers he has, the fact he doesn't have guests, whatever American late night talk show doesn't have guests. It's just him monologuing to the camera for the whole episode with a few cutaway comedy bits once in a while. Because what he said, and, I love, and again, great thing with it being on HBO, the shows can be as long as they need to be. It's no like set time. He does. He does feel like he's uh, he's he, he's. He's hit his stride now, especially like from the pandemic where they had to go. Like he was doing oh, yeah. his house and in the void, <laughs> in the in the big white void. But yeah, like they're, they're, I think we don't need to like labor the point. Last week tonight with John Oliver is one of the most fantastic and and um, important shows I think that we have. And uh, next up, a show I don't. I think I know very little about. It's I my think... show, Neil. It's mine. It's uh, Drive, to, <laughs> Drive to Survive on Netflix. It's the Formula One show that is more more about what happens behind the scenes on Formula One than the actual racing itself. Uh, it is glorious. It has spawned several offshoots. They've done a golf one now and a tennis one, but neither Whoa. of them are any, anywhere near as good as the epic drive to survive. Golf to uh, survive. No, it's not golf to survive, you fool. Um, but it's, uh, it, if you have any interest in sport at all, this is one of the go-to sport documentary series just mm. because of how like up close and personal they get with everybody, all the super famous people in the sport and the people behind the scenes, they have unlimited access everywhere. And you can tell it pisses everybody off because Netflix (laughs) um, have brought new life to formula one, which means it's brought new money, Mm. which means everybody has to put up with it. So you really do get warts and all stuff with, uh, with drive to survive. So that's, you know, my take on one of the greatest sporting documentary series of all times. Please watch. This is the only sport I give a hell of a fuck about. But what if what if you're not a fan of Formula One racing? Well, actually, you know what? I've I've actually played. Uh, I've actually showed this to people. A, a friend of mine who isn't into Formula One was like, "Oh, you like Formula One? Watch this." And I was like, "Don't know about that, mate." And then I watched it and fell in love with it. So someone who wasn't into Formula One, who knew I was, like, told me to watch it, and I was converted. Yeah. So I know for a fact that if you don't, even if you don't even like any sports, but you want to watch, there's quite a lot of glitz and glamour with it. With like, you know the um monaco grand prix and all that stuff so you get like a lot of like other stars in there as well but it's consistently good over the the seasons that we've had so far it's been consistently great i know my brother and my sister will like that there you go see ben's recommendations this this next one uh, kind of surprised me especially from you guys it's not for me it's from ben and i, I know exactly why ben put this one on the list because of captain mal reynolds in philly and we trust in Philly and we trust. Everything Nathan Fillion does is phenomenal. So this next one, uh, the last one on the long list is The Rookie. Uh, and it's the a police procedural set in LA. Um, so yeah, so it's Nathan Fillion's vehicle uh, since he had uh, his uh, interesting time in the Buffyverse, then over to Firefly. Uh, then obviously he had some huge success with Castle, which was you know him, him being more of his like cheeky side and, and, and doing you know that kind of police procedural or crime drama. Uh, going straight into something which I think looks very favorably on uh, the LAPD, which you don't really get a show like The Rookie that shows that police work is really, really tough, uh, but also that the, the, you know there are good people that do that job and, and so on and so forth. Now, my best friend is a police officer in the UK, and I know for a fact how much terrible, terrible stuff he has to deal with before you know getting shouted at in the press for the one or two bad things that that get you know that get um sort of focused on so i love a show like this where like the rookie is it seems to it seems to sort of give you a a, a fake scripted side of what what the police have to deal with but also i feel like there's i think it's well researched and i think it's i, I think it's got a good heart would would the cynical part of me say it's just a like a really good public relations vehicle for the LAPD who notoriously yeah. have lots of bad press in recent years. I don't, I don't think there's many police uh, organizations that, that have good press. So, so I think that like, and it, cause it's because they do, they do a job that is so important and touches so many di- different people's lives in so many different ways that it's difficult to, to weed out the bad from the good sometimes or the good from the bad, should I say, that's a fair thing to say. Like it is, it is a bit like, you know, like uh, wallpaper and over the cracks, but also at the same time, it is really entertaining. Nathan Fillion is fantastic in it. The supporting cast are, excellent and you know if i want one of those shows i just need to turn my brain off and and just you know laugh with and you know get emotionally involved in from time to time then this is exactly what i need all right uh well from a show about police to a show about crime and now this show is a special shout out because it started at the end of last year and it finished in january and i think it's already like etching its way into my best of the year shows already in february as we record this and that is fargo season five on amazon prime 
And you can watch all 10 episodes now. It stars Juno Temple as a woman who's run away from her, her abusive ex-husband, played by John Hamm, and she's made a new life for herself under a fake name and identity. And that's before you even get to the greatness of Jennifer Jason Lee in it, who's fucking superb, and Joe Keery, Steve Harrington from Stranger Things, being an even bigger arsehole in the show than Steve yeah. Harrington was in the first series of Stranger Things. And honestly, right, if you haven't seen any Fargo before, it doesn't matter, because it's an anthology show. No, there's no connection between the seasons, really, except one and two. And even then, you could watch them, you know, the one take place like 30 years after. So each season is pretty much standalone. So if you want to see Juno Temple being absolutely awesome, and John Hamm being an utter bastard. Watch Fargo. <laughs> utter bastard. <laughs> utter bastard. You, you're saying it made it because it, it went through this the year? Yeah, or? it started it started in like November and then it finished in January. So technically okay. the last episode aired this year. And it's just that <laughs> fucking good. I was like, yeah, sorry. Uh and the last show on our long list is a show that I kind of feel ashamed isn't on our main list, my main list, but it's because we literally it was only announced a couple of days ago that it's coming back next month in March, Ooh. and that is everyone's favourite superhero flat share sitcom with a character called Juice Lord. Yep. <laughs> Extraordinary Season 2 is dropping on Disney+. Plus. Um, at the minute, we've only had a few production steals and no trader yet, but even from the images, I can't wait. You've got a shot of like the main character, Jen, staring someone's lazy the hole for a bookcase. Um, you've got Carrie looking stressed, you've got Cash Liddy looking idiotic, and uh, Juice Lord laying there on the bed, covered in bottles of milk with a kitten. I have no idea what's going on there, but I need to know. As we mentioned, we had one of the show's editors, Dan Crinian, on uh, last year to talk about season one. And I'm sure we're going to attempt to try and get someone from the show on for season two when it comes out next month. Mm. So, uh, And I'm sure it'll probably be high up in our list again. Because if they bottle the lightning they got with um, Extraordinary Season 1, and hopefully they're going to do it for Season 2. Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, like this is one of the shows that I didn't know about until you guys started talking about it on this podcast. So I, <laughs> when I was with my girlfriend in, uh, in LA, we we put on the first episode and was like, oh, we'll give it a watch. And then before we knew it, we'd watch like three episodes and it was fantastic. So <laughs> like, yeah, this, I'm glad this is getting a mention, uh, but, like, it, it, but it isn't something that is exciting me like the stuff on my main list. Yes. So, and that's the difference between our long lists and... Uh, and the stuff because I love the stuff that I've put on on the long list, but it's not exciting me in the way that this long list stuff is exciting me. Right. Well, that finishes our long list section, and, and now it's time to move on to our top tens. Yay. So, with David not being here, we're gonna now play you what David's number ten was. Take it away, David. Hello there, Neil, Ben, and Jose. It's your boy David here, coming at you with his top ten hits from the future of television. And I'm gonna stop the uh, radio voice already because I was annoying myself. Uh, my number 10, guys, is I think a show that's not on anybody else's list. It is from the creators or the showrunners, I should say, of... Were they creators? Uh, whatever. Of the show that was the best show on TV and then it turned out to be the worst show on TV. Game of Thrones. And we've got the free body problem. Uh, this show made my list kind of because they were working on it in a weird way, even though I fucking hate their guts. Because they know how to adapt a good book, and this is a good book. The Free Body Problem is a brilliant book, and Game of Thrones is, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire is a brilliant book, and they adapted A Song of Ice and Fire amazingly for TV. So I'm hoping that they're able to adapt this amazingly for TV, which is why it's made number 10 on my list. Just as long as they just take the keyboard, pick it up, take it away from them, don't let them write a single fucking thing. Just don't let them do it, because it's, because it's awful, and they, and they don't know how. I've, sorry, I've seen more recent interviews from them and it's, oh my god, the level of delusion is unreal. But anyway, The Free Body Problem is coming on to Netflix, uh, March 21st. And uh, the synopsis is it follows the story of humanity's first contact with alien civilization. Uh, seeing humanity being vulnerable to that uh, to that external threat. You're looking forward to it. Number 10 on my list. I saw that trailer. I think it's interesting, but I just don't know if it can deliver. I saw that trailer and I don't know what it's going on. It hurt my brain. Ha. I think it, I think it's one of those shows that's going to be limited to maybe one season um, because because of the insane budget on it. <laughs> that too. I think because it's one of those that's premise is so niche, it's going to be tough to pivot after the first season. Like, okay, either they resolve what's going on or then it goes on to the next chapter of what's happening because obviously uh, if you've seen the trailer – People are dying, and they're the smartest people. They're scientists from Earth, and there seems to be some uh, extraterrestrial reasoning 
to it all, but we don't know what or why. I think it's one of those shows. It could be massive or it could be a pile of poo. So we don't know yet until we see it. <laughs> Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's series. Schrodinger, Schrodinger's poo. <laughs> That's box, just Schrodinger's different. box of poo. Uh, it's definitely yeah. not what I expected the show to be compared to when it was I'm made. I'm not going to buy that if I see it on eBay. No, definitely not. Uh, ben, what do you have at your number 10? Oh, number ten. All right. So this is this is my uh, my journey all the way all the way through everything Star Wars this year. Uh, my number ten <laughs> is a series called The Acolyte. It's a Star Wars series that takes viewers into a, the galaxy of shadowy secrets and emerging dark side powers in the final days of the High Republic, roughly about a hundred years before um, Episode One uh, yeah. of the Star Wars franchise. Um, now I always get I always get names wrong on the podcast, but it's written by um, Charmaine de Great. Or de Gratte, I don't know how you say that, but uh, the the most uh, sort of famous thing they would have done would have been um, Game of Thrones: House of the Dragon. So, okay. like, Charmaine is one one of the main writers on this show. Um, so, for me, Star Wars spinoffs have been a little hit and miss recently, but I'm hoping with that kind of gravitas that that Charmaine brings to the House of Dragon, that this could be quite epic. So, I mean, if you compare like Star Wars series like Andor, like which Love was Andor. just truly awesome, and then the other side of it with Boba Fett, which like wasn't. you know, it was not good, not good. Get in um, a back to tank. I, get, get in and stay in there. <laughs> um, I hope that the, the, the a series set way before what we already know can like could kind of act as a soft reset and cleanse a palette before you know it gets stuck in and explore some of the original lore of what makes a Jedi become a Sith. Um, you know, like it, it, so it stands to be like quite an exciting project. On the other hand, it could fall apart like wet cake if they get into the like the religion of the Jedi Order. <laughs> if you think about how like divisive that could be, almost. I suppose it sounds like it's going to be a bit more on the Andor scale than it's like a bit more serious. Yeah, yeah. Star Wars, you know, which is I mean, and that's what that's the thing now. I think people have realised there is room for all different kinds of Star Wars. You know, you got. I think there's another show we're we'll talking about later that um, is heavily tailored a lot more towards kids. In mm. Star Wars universe, rather than uh, this, I like. I mean, I think if you showed Andor to the average like kid who watched, you know, I don't know the the, m- the more recent trilogy, they'd be like, "It's a bit slow, it's a bit boring." Mm. But then you show it to us, and we're like, "Fuck yeah, that's what we wanted for years." Yeah. Actors, <laughs> good actors in Star Wars. <laughs> like every actor who's ever been in a shit Star Wars film, or not shit Star Wars film. Let me phrase that: every actor who's ever had really bad dialogue to deliver in Star Wars, and has been an amazing actor, has looked at Andor and gone. Fucking Stellan Stalsgaard delivering Shakespearean style monologues about the, nice. the power of sacrifice and uh, oh, it's just Ooh, like Andy Serkis's monologue. Oh, it's just I and I was like, here is proof you can make serious Star Wars for adults that is just ju- proper up there is a brilliant dramatic show. It felt like I was watching a HBO drama of like you know that peak TV quality yeah. stuff. Yeah, but you have to, but that proves that you have to take it away from like the original kind of concept or almost a little yeah. bit like yeah. if you get rid of if you get rid of uh lightsabers for the most part you get rid of like that kind of childhood like rush from everybody but also you get to have a little bit more you've got to, you've got to really knuckle down and make it make it watchable and make it really relatable and mm-hmm. that's what Andor did really really well so this the acolyte so it could it could be really really great because you get like the start of like the sith really turning things around and like upsetting the Jedi Order, who have been the who, and and you get to see the Jedi Order as the peacekeepers, not just like you know they're on their back foot, like going, well, there's some Sith somewhere. We've heard, felt this weird thing in the Force, and it doesn't feel good, and I don't like it. Uh, and you know, and then they then they get blindsided by the two Sith. But um, but yeah, no, I think I think this could be really really good. And uh, I, I'm 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 where am I? I'm like seventy thirty that I think it's going to be good at the moment. That's why it's number mm-hmm. ten. I'll be honest, Andor really, really solidified my trust in Star Wars shows again. Because after Boba Fett, I was just like, oh, my God, I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think for me, on Star Wars shows, you have to take it on the team behind it. Because I still think you're going to get some stuff that isn't potentially brilliant. But I feel like after how pants Boba Fett was, and um, I wasn't a bigger fan of Kenobi either. And yeah, ah- ah- Ahsoka. And I thought Ahsoka was fine to really good to fine. It was like in the middle for me. So I'd be like a six to a seven out of ten for me. Like mm. I, I appreciated the act. It had again, it had great acting in it. It had a slower pace than perhaps we expect from Star Wars. So I think they're kind of over the curve of bad Star Wars now. I think there's that yeah. quality level. Everything at the very least is going to be good. So uh, yeah, we'll wait and see on that one. 
Jose, what do you have at your number 10? I have the completely made up adventures of Dick Turpin. That sounds like you've just completely made that show up. <laughs> I was looking up the releases and this is an Apple TV show. And there's actually not a lot out there on the information. And when you look at what they've provided, it's just a, a basically a guy who decided to become the leader of an Essex gang. He's a son of a butcher who's a vegan, and he's also a peace-loving criminal. And, like, with that little information, you know, what is what is that going to be, be? But, like, when I saw the trailer, Ben, don't hate me with this, it's, it reminded me of another version of Firefly because yeah. of the comedy. You know, it, it was just, like, really smart, and it, it, it was, like, good, good angst, you know. And it's obviously, like, in a different era and a different kind of genre. But I, I was... Just... Is it in space? <laughs> no, it's not. Well, then how is it like Firefly? <laughs> it's you, the Jose. comedy. It's the comedy that... you, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I figured, that if anything, with my number 10, I'd throw something out there that may not be on your radar. And then I, I think it's it's British-based, so I don't know any of the actors. Oh, well, and... Jose, I looking at, up while you were doing that, because I knew nothing about this, mm -hmm. Dick Turpin is played by... The legendary Noel Fielding from the Mighty Bush. No, really? Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I'm all in. <laughs> okay. That's Jose, That's your brilliant. homework is to look up Noel Fielding, and then this will then, probably make uh, you even more excited about the show. And then tell us in the group chat which your favourite episode of the Mighty Bush is. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking mental, man. It's like so weird. I'm gonna. I'd love to get your take on it. I think I've actually heard of that show. No of course, man. and he was in the IT crowd as well back in the day. He's a golf guy who lived in the basement. If you've ever seen the Great British Bake Off, he's like one of the he's one of the guys. He's the main yeah, guy. Yeah, oh. he's, he's, he does that. That's how everybody um, knows But him. this is out on March the first. Yeah, wow, so that's not long. Good at timing. All. I think the first three episodes only, but it does look like it's going to be really good. It just looks like a, a good fun comedy to start my list with. Was it just vegan highwayman that made you think I'm going to watch this? This seems funny. Well. Once I saw the trailer, I had to do some research, but there really isn't a lot with them when I was looking for, for Google results. So um, I just I figured, you know what? Let me just put a top, top 10 right there. And at my number 10, man, I have another new Apple show that's, I think, going to be with us in May, I think. And that show is called Dark Matter. And this is an adaptation mm. of Blake Crouch's brilliant sci-fi novel of the same name, which I read last year. And uh, Crouch himself just posted the first teaser trailer this week, tweeting, I wrote the book. I wrote the show. The show's better, and I was like, "That's, <laughs> that's high praise." Because um, wow, I loved I love the book, man. Like I, I've read a few of Crouch's books now. I think I've read three, and they're always like really high concept sci fi, but they're written in such a way that they're not confusing, and you get the kind of real the the, the main points of the story across really well, and they're much easier to follow than something like Tenant when you're jumping realities. I mean, and that's kind of what this show is. So, Dark Matter is a story of a Chicago physicist who is warped into an alternate version of his life, leaving him to fight to return to his life to prevent the alternate version of himself from harming his family. And whoever wrote that as a premise on Wikipedia, do better, because that was terrible. <laughs> so you decided you decided to like copy it verbatim. Yeah, well done. Do better yourself, Neil. Why don't you just rewrite it and post it on Wikipedia yourself, you lazy well, git? If I had this thing <laughs> called time, which, you know, ironically, no, I don't know if there's time. No, there's not time travel show. But um, yeah, so the, stars, the show stars Joel Egerton as Jason Dessen, the main character, and Jennifer Connelly as his wife, Daniela. Now, I'm really glad this landed at Apple because Netflix is kind of currently circling another one of his books that I've read that is brilliant. And uh, honestly, Netflix is the last place his close books should end up. I, I am slightly annoyed, though, that in Apple's, like, premise and the, like, the initial trailer they've put out, they have given away the very first twist in the story, which I thought would have been perfect for the end of Ooh. the first episode. So I'm not going to say that what that is here, but um, right. if you, if you want to go in completely blank to this, just don't read out anything about it. Just go in, because I'm sure that the twist that they've given away is going to be the end of the first episode, because for nice. me, that would just be the perfect way to end it. Uh, the show's main tagline is The Road Not Taken. And it's, it's almost like, it seems a weird thing to compare it with, but it's almost like a sliding door style moments in the book where we see how like the different realities are playing out. I'll tell you what it's like, Ben. Fringe, when you've got the two different, you've got the regular world and then you've got the other one. Nice. Imagine this is kind of, that makes me think of this a little bit as well. So you've kind of got these two divergent realities and then the stories are taking place kind of at the same time. So mm -hmm. really looking forward to this one. Good, good old fashioned hard sci-fi on Apple. Hashtag hard sci-fi on Apple. And this brings us to David's number nine, which is... Number nine on my list, guys, is a bit of a weird one. 
but bear with me. It's coming out of left field. It's a tackle in the deep. Last minute substitution. Sunderland Till I Die, the uh, Netflix documentary. That uh, is a football Netflix documentary that follows Sunderland, the, I think, then League One club, but now Championship club. But I think it's going to follow that. Uh, basically, this it's just it, this documentary was for me it was the the best uh footballing documentary that there is um me and myself me and myself that doesn't make any sense me and neil are both uh big footballing fans and sunday until i die is by far the best footballing documentary there is it's like the blueprint uh for each other documentary to have followed such as you know um welcome to wrexham um it, it this one really was brilliant and probably because it was negative for a lot of it like it's it's basically just a lot of shit happening no one was really happy with the results because Sunderland basically went from the championship and got relegated were relegated from the premiership to the championship relegated from the championship down to league one it was pretty shit for them so this new season uh will hopefully have a little bit of hope coming coming their way to the old Sunderland fans uh but yeah Sunderland till I die a uh, fantastic footballing documentary and that's number nine on my list and I have never heard of this show in my life. Sunderland Till I Die, season three. I'm sorry, but there is not enough season space. Three. in it. Yeah, like, Sunderland, Jose, are not, you know, like you've got Wrexham, okay? So there are, I think they're above Wrexham in the leagues. Uh, if you've watched any, welcome to Wrexham. But generally, they're not, not to annoy any listeners we may have in Sunderland or the North East, but I'd never even heard of this show and it's made it to a th- third series. So, um I'm glad you've enjoyed so it. So they're now even relevant. They're not even relevant. <laughs> they're relevant to the people that like them. And uh, Sunderland is full of very, very, very tough people. So I'm not going to say anything bad about oh. it whatsoever. Yeah, Jose, I don't think you can go to oh, Sunderland you're, now. You're you're definitely out of uh, out of arm's reach there, wherever you, wherever you are in the US. But it's right now. probably on, safe on just to apologize <laughs> right now. Uh, Sunderland, I I I'm a big fan of your your city. Sunderland's a tough place, man. Like it's um like it's right below um and I mean geographically, um, Newcastle. It's over the river from Newcastle. So it's like, you know, like it's uh, very working class, it's very like and I've played I play gigs there, I've done loads of cool stuff, I've got loads oh. of friends there. It's like it's a it's it's if you get if you go on a good if you're a night out there, you'll never forget it. It's fucking <laughs> wild. Um but but I've I've never heard the show and I and I don't I don't really follow soccer either, football, so you know, like did you ever watch uh, Ben? Did you ever watch Welcome to Wrexham though? Because I watched the first season. Yeah, I watched the first season, and it, and it disgusted me how into football it made me. Um, which is like, <laughs> which is like the drive to survive thing. I was like, uh, you know, it, it's the same thing. I've only got room. I, my schedule is that I only have room for one sport in my life, and I can barely keep up with F one properly. So, uh, I, as much as I respect both of those, uh, you know, teams and shows, I won't probably be watching it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm not, I wasn't even in, but I'm out. Uh, uh, ben, this moves us on to your number nine. My number nine. Oh, yeah. Um, so my number nine is called Shogun, uh, based on the novel by James Cavell. Uh, it already turned into a mini series in the 80s, I've, I found out in my research. Um, th- this new version is Fox's new period show set in the 17th century. It's a story, or at least told from his perspective, of British hero in inverted commas, um, John Blackthorne, a sailor who rises from outsider to samurai, was being used as a pawn in Japanese leader, oh, here we go, Toran Agas, Tor- Toran Angas struggle to reach the top of the ruling chain, the position of Shogun. Being a sucker for a good samurai story, uh, this really has the potential to be a very engaging and intelligent series. The trailer for this looks stunning visually as well as, um, as sonically. Um, it feels like it will stay as accurate as possible historically, which is, for me, almost as important as everything else you do in a show like this. I mean, if you compare it to um, uh, The Last Samurai, the the, the Tom Cruise uh, movie, it's, you know, that that for me was, it was very Hollywood and it was very, like, I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, this to, this to me, the Shogun feels like it's it's going to be from a place of, of absolute knowledge and, you know, and is really going to, give the the samurai that we all know and love uh some some much needed airtime. yeah looking at the cast mate um you've got john wick four's hiriyaku sanada in it um he was the manager of the uh t- was it the tokyo uh, continental? continental yeah but i mean he's 
but he's in so much stuff that like he he almost feels like um like he almost feels like a go-to character like a go-to Bull actor train. when i looked up the cast and i saw him on it i was just like oh my god it's this guy and he's in so much stuff that i was like i'm not even going to mention the cast because i could spend like 10 minutes just talking about the stuff that he's been in yeah, yeah. Um, well the yeah. only other person I want to mention on the cast is Anna Sawe who's also in um, Monarch Legacy of Monsters so, I mean she's having a hell of a run she was in Fast and the Furious 9 she was in that she was also Apple's other show uh, Pachinko which came out the other year and Giri Hadji which was a brilliant BBC one it was written by the same guy Joe Barton who did um, Lazarus Project it was going to be on FX in the States and it's going to be on Disney Plus I think the day after in the UK oh cool so we're not going to yeah. have to wait too long for it so yay Shogun well, Hi. Jose, that brings us on to your number nine. And I think I have an issue here, Jose. I think you might have a, a potential disqualification on your hands here. Ah, you know, I, I was risking this. Explain your work. I have some recent news from about 24 hours of the time of recording that Rebecca Ferguson admitted that they're going to finish filming on the March March 8th. For? Silo season two. And uh, so I made this list before that, uh, not knowing what was the situation. But I am really genuinely such a fan of the show. It was a slow burn, but it's such a, a good return at the end of the season. And I'm really interested. And I'm actually kind of avoiding the books. So that way I can enjoy the yeah. show more. I'm staying away from the books. I stay away from all books. A friend of mine read the first book and he says that the, the first season doesn't cover the entire book. And there are some differences. And I almost don't want to ruin the show for myself by by seeing certain differences or and or just seeing the actual results of what happens later. And or? Is this another Ewok spinoff? Oh, and doors. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. That was terrible. Terrible. Sounds terrible. <laughs> but yes, so uh, as far as news, there isn't much, and she couldn't even really give much other than the fact that they're finishing uh, filming. I'll give you a bit of hope, March. Jose. I will give you a tiny bit of hope, Jose. When you make the first series of a show, obviously, you've got to, everything's got to be set up, hasn't it? You know, because, you know, I yes. work in post production as an editor, it's a day job. When you've done the second series, you've got a lot of stuff in place from the first, so the turnaround time might not be as long. So you might you might get it start before the end of the year. You've you know March till you know they got nine months right. It's so uh, yes. and a lot of it was in the one solo right. It's in the one set. So again, mm-hmm. solo didn't have as much action. It was more kind of a drama, wasn't it? Really than a yes. what you say an action or a thriller. So. Um, I think it's possible you might get something before the end of the year on this. For, and that's yeah. just apropos of absolutely nothing, but having a tiny bit of knowledge of how post-production works. Yes, I would ho- aim, I, I would hope for like a December Christmas release at best. So Merry Christmas. What What's in the vault? Hey, What's Death. in the vault? Gwyneth Paltrow's severed head. No. Dude, that's, too, that's too far. It's too far. No seven heads at Christmas, please. Come on. And that brings us on to my number nine, which is another f- show that Ben's going to be very excited about, and that is another Star Wars show, Skeleton Crew. Yeah. Or, as it's been called, Stand hey. By Me Wars or uh, Goonie Wars. Uh, yeah, none of those work <laughs> uh, at all. But um, the basic premise of this show is that four young children end up on an adventure to find their way home after being lost in the galaxy following a discovery they make on their home planet. So basically Stargate. Uh, no. Well, actually, it could be, but hey. <laughs> Uh, top line in the cast is Jude Law as a force user. And I'm assuming he's just going to go into full Mando territory in this. You know, he's going to be the guy, go away, you damn kids. And then, oh, okay, I'll help you, you know, as, as the show goes on. Uh, the show does have four relative newcomers as a kid. And also, the only other actor of note I noticed was uh, Banshees of Inner Sheeran's Kerry Condon is in it as well. Uh, probably will not be playing Space Irish. But um, the series will also be revealed he's to be Irish. set. Space Irish, just invented it. There you go. Uh, the series <laughs> is also revealed to be set after the events of Return of the Jedi 1983. And just like The Mandalorian was described as a galactic version of the classic Amberlin coming of age adventure films of the 80s. So basically, it's going to be a bunch of snot nosed kids making their way across the galaxy on the voyage home. I feel like I feel like Jude Law's character is going to be somewhere between uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Han Solo in this because he's like he's like they, mm. they called him Skeleton Crew. Like he's the guy with the ship, I guess that he's the one that scoops them up. I'm making a lot of assumptions here. I this know that I we don't know anything about this yet. <laughs> this is literally this is on my list later on. My whole thing about this was is just like I kind of hope it's like there's a Millennium Falcon esque like ship that's brilliant in some way, but also beaten up and fucked. Like Jude Law's character is like that, like that kind of loner, basically Firefly. <laughs> that's what I'm looking for again. More Firefly. More Firefly. That's all you ask. That's all I ask. But yeah, I'm I'm excited about this as well. Awesome, awesome. 
Well, that brings us on to David's number eight. And again, a show that I don't think is on any of our lists. Is he making this stuff up? This show does actually exist. It's a third series and it is quite well known. David, tell us, what is your number eight? Good evening, dear listeners. Prepare for another season of sex, love, scandal and romance. As uh, Lazy Whistledown brings us all the gossip happening in Bridgerton season three. Uh, I'm all about, guys... I'm all about Penelope and Colin in this season. They follow, like, we've, we, you know, the formula's set now. We're following a Bridgerton, uh, you know, the oldest Bridgertons going down the list. We've had um, Anthony's in the last season, and now we're getting Colin's. Uh, but Penelope, but this is the first one where Penelope's already, like, an established character, and it's, it's going to be their romance, and it's going to be super sad in certain scenes, and it's going to be super romantic, and it's going to be just lovely. It's just lovely. It's just one of those shows that you can just, you can get a little bit camp over and just enjoy it because it's just a lovely, lovely romantic. You get all, you get all wrapped up in the, in the scandal of it all. And yeah, anyway, Bridget and season three, looking forward to it. Uh, it's coming in two parts on Netflix. Part one's dropping in May, um, 16th of May and part two is dropping in June 13th. Why it's dropping in two parts? Well, it's because they want you to spend more money on the subscription, which is a bit of a bitch. But there you go. And so I have to say this is definitely heavily involved because of his wife. It has to be. <laughs> David might enjoy a good period drama himself. He might, he might not have been co-opted into it. With a lot of steamy sex scenes that are... David blatantly loves Bridgerton. Come on. It's definitely up his, <laughs> up his particular field of interest. It's it's it, If it had a dragon in it, he he would he would have a hard on about it straight away. Like, Bridget, <laughs> Bridgerton Bridgerton with dragons. I mean, Game of Thrones is basically Bridgerton with dragons. Come on, pocket dragon. We, we all we all know it. David is only now realizing the follow you've not been able to make it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there is no chance to come back. Uh, so Ben, this brings us on to your number eight. My number eight. Oh, this is a good one. I think this is a good one. Uh, my number eight is Cobra Kai. The, uh, the Netflix spin-off of the Karate Kid movies. Uh, it's the final season of said series. It's been building for such a long time now, and it's pretty much rinse and repeat from uh, from Netflix. Wax on, um, wax off. Wax, it, it, oh, I should have said that. It's pretty much wax on, wax off from Netflix. Uh, the same thing over and over again. But I love it. Like The escalation from series one to where are they now? Like series six? Like it, it, It's like, it's ridiculous. Like The more... They up the ante. The more ridiculous things they have to do, like you know, like like um, Miguel breaking his back, like in a in a fight in the school, which would have had the police turn up and probably shooting most people had that been a, a real like breakout. That was a real fight. thing. That was a that was a, that actually happened. He, he gets kicked over a, a, a like a over like Anister, a doesn't he? A, like a yeah, wow. but it's like a it's like a stairwell, and he hits the ban hits the railing on his way down and breaks his back, and then he has to, Ooh. and then like his journey in the net in that series is he has to like. Like, about three episodes of Johnny just telling him to get up. Yeah, just like being just a dick, tough, tough loving him, <laughs> taking him to a D Snyder concert in a wheelchair. Oh, um, like, which incidentally, they uh, they filmed uh, at a venue that I happened to be watching a band at when I was in America in Atlanta. As we uh, as we left the venue, there was all the production trucks for that um, particular series, Cobra Kai, right? Awesome. They had to. They keep having to up the ante. So I'm I'm expecting all out karate nuclear war in this. <laughs> but basically. <laughs> Basically, it's like this is the uh, this is the culmination of the saga of the Miyagi Do Karate and the Battle of the All Valley, the All Valley Karate Championships. Which, when I was a kid, I had no idea what the All Valley was. I didn't realize that California was a bunch of. Valleys. I had no idea what a valley was. Well, there you go. You live in Dover, which is three valleys, almost exactly the same as uh, as LA, which is. <laughs> I don't know that now. So there's rumors that this season that Johnny will be uh, will be getting his his dojo back after cruelly being taken away from him in like season one or season two, whenever Daniel LaRusso turned into a dick and did that thing to him. He really is a uh, dick, isn't he? Yeah. It was, I, I love the, I do. The thing that drew me to this in the first place was like, it was like, it was that, um, there was that fan, uh, theory that actually karate kid was told from the wrong point of view. And that, that oh. actually Daniel LaRusso was the bad guy. Cause he comes in and blows into town, steals a guy's girlfriend, uh, like picks a fight with him and, and every, every turn makes him look like an asshole. But it was kind of six in one, half a dozen the other, in my opinion. That is not a fan theory. That is actually something on the TV show How I Met Your Mother. Barney oh, Stinson. Oh, okay. And they, he actually makes an appearance as an undercover clown to to surprise him for his birthday. That's great. That's that was, cool. Yeah. So I, so I don't know. I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. But whichever way it was, 
the uh, the <laughs> the Cobra Kai like you know starts out with Johnny being like you know he, he useless he's at down life. and out and he's you know and he, and he uses karate to make his comeback and then Daniel Russo beats him down and quite literally thinks that Cobra Kai is the worst thing ever so you know but then they up the ante and they bring back uh, like you know John Kreese and then they bring back the the other guy with a ponytail who you yes. know like make his knuckles bleed you know uh, so like so we've got to a point now where. Uh, there's there's this huge martial arts competition outside of the uh, the almighty All Valley that will decide the fate of who can finally teach karate in LA. I mean, like, <laughs> can't we all just get along? I know for a fact I've been to LA. There's a shitload of dojos. You can all teach karate. You just leave each other the fuck alone. This, but that is not suspending disbelief. But I honestly think we're in we're in for a ride here. I think there's a very good chance we'll see some huge teenage battle royale scenes. And you know, like I don't know, how, like I said, I don't know how they're going to up the ante from. Uh, the 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 huge fight that happened across like um, someone's house and and a and a, a dojo and all. I saw that stuff. episode. It was pretty intense. It was actually. ridiculous. It was ridiculous. All, yeah. the, all those kids would be in prison right now. Yes, for the definitely. amount of damage they've done to each other. Uh, and then <clears throat> the most sort of exciting, I guess, part of it for me is the will they won't they friendship between Daniel and Johnny. Like it's the thing that keeps you coming back for more. The central just, relationship of the show, isn't it? They have they yeah, they do. They have this thing where just like whenever they start to get on, I'm like, yes, it's finally gonna happen. They're gonna like, like high five or like bro <laughs> hug or I don't know, make out or whatever it is they've got pent up for, for, for <laughs> since the eighties. Like and it, and they keep dangling it in front of us like 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 this beautiful like you know moment and oh. then they keep snatching it away. So yeah, I just want them to make like Cobra Doe or Miyagi Kai like dojos and 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 you know because ultimately one is for, one self defense one is for self defense and one is for attack and if they combine their styles they will truly create the best karate in the world i i don't think there's anything more we need to add to that perfect right, no. and then there's that movie coming as well which is going to be oh fuck that that's it's, it's going to be it's, it's going to be it's going to be either amazing in a bad way or bad in an amazing way <laughs> Oh, we, oh, where is it on the Madden Web scale? No, <laughs> there is no Madden Web scale. That film doesn't exist. I mean, I'm going to go and see it just so I can say I've I've, I've witnessed the I horror of someone's mother dying in the Amazon while researching spiders. Oh my god! Shit. Uh, let's go and see that one together, Neil. I'll get shit faced and shout stuff at it. Okay, sounds good. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jose, this brings us on to your number eight, which is my number eight is Shogun. So Ben did a wonderful job of talking about it. I think what one thing he didn't mention is that um, the episodes are going to come out weekly, which I think is a great format because it just allows for a lot more interest to build throughout the series. And um, I, honestly, when I first saw this, it wasn't such a huge uh, thing for me. But recently, I've been watching Blue Eyed Samurai on Netflix, and I, I think I've just grown to enjoy the genre a lot more. And so, again, I just it got kind of pushed up with the, the little bit more that I learned about it. I, I am a big fan of the the cast of the, the few characters that I know. So um, yeah, there are not there are not enough good samurai shows, man. There should be at least a good one every year, like a great samurai show. And we got two now, hopefully, because you got this and you got Blue Eyed Samurai. Um, yes. Again, also Blue Eyed Samurai, I, I heavily recommend it. It's not for kids, though. Not for kids. For kids. Yes. I was surprised by that penis in that episode. <laughs> and from the penis to my number eight, the penguin. Oh yes, and, uh, yes. God, this is that a, was awful. That was a terrible penis to penguin uh, segue, <laughs> but we'll stick with it. We'll stick with it. Uh, created by Lauren LeFranc, the Penguin is set one week after the events of Matt Reeves, the Bad Man, Ooh. and will chart the rise to power of Colin Farrell's Oswald Cobblepot, I've always known as the Penguin. So basically, this should be Gotham, but good, right? Because <laughs> it's funny because when Gotham was pitched, it was supposed to be a HBO style drama about criminals and corrupt cops and law in a broken Gotham and how, you know, the police were just as bad as some of the criminals are supposed to catch. And look, it had some of its high points, right? It ran for a lot of episodes, but eventually it just become really kind of campy fun at best. And it cast young versions of pretty much every Batman character going as it just limped along to a really lackluster final season. So what makes The Penguin potentially better than Gotham? Well, first of all, it's actually made by HBO and it's directly tied into Matt Reeves' universe with Colin Farrell reprising his role from the film where he was brilliant. Matt Reeves is exec producing the series. So obviously it's going to tie into Batman 2 whenever we get that. Also, it's only eight episodes, which seems about the right amount to do some good character work, plant the seeds for Batman 2 
and Gotham stretched for over 100 episodes. I can't believe I watched over 100 hours of Gotham. Did you, did you get to, sorry, did you get to the end of Gotham? I did, yes. I, I, I limped along to the end of it and it was very like, unmemorable. I feel like I watched the end of it as well and that little kid ended up being Batman in a very much the same way at the end of um, Smallville. Like well, the, he the, kind of the, could. They could have kind of showed it, but couldn't. But yeah, but kind of did, but kind of didn't. And I think Smallville did it better, to be fair, because I can remember that, and I can't remember this. Yeah, we, we were younger though, so you know <laughs> that's true. Every, memory, memory. Age. Sounds like a song from a band. Somebody save me, Remy Zero. There you go, <laughs> one hit wonders. Um, and finally, we got a great supporting cast. You got Christian Miliotti. Uh, you remember her from How I Met Your Mother, and also she was in USS Callister episode of Black Mirror. She was the oh, woman wow. that gets uh, abducted into the uh, the thing by and, uh, Jesse Plemons, you know. And a wonderful rom com time travel loop uh, with uh, Andy Samberg. That was a really good oh, one. Oh, that movie's great. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's amazing. So, uh, yeah, so she's the female lead in the show by the looks of things, playing uh, Sophia Falcone, Carmine's daughter, and she's kind of fighting Cobblepot for control of Gotham's criminal underworld. Also, you have. The Kurgan himself. Clancy Brown from Highlander is on board as Salvatore Moroni, another girl from Gangster. And so already, everyone in this is just like gangsters and criminals. So it's not going into the whole, you know, superhero and supervillain realm that I've got from like fell into almost immediately when it was trying to do something different. So uh, the show was due out early this year, but was delayed before the strikes. But hopefully we are going to get it towards the end of the year. Because I remember last year, I think about this time last year, they released a... Uh, in production promo and showed like a minute and a half from it and was like, yeah, this looks fucking good. Give us it now. And then, of course, <laughs> tried. So, yeah, the penguin. Pick up a penguin. Oh, that was good. Call back, Ryan. <laughs> and that brings us on to David's number seven, which is a show he wasn't really that much a fan of the first series. So I'm surprised this made it this high on the list. Explain your thinking, David. Explain it now. My number seven show took me a little bit by surprise. Because I didn't realise I was actually looking forward to seeing the second season of this show based off of the first season. And that show is The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. I remember when me and Neil reviewed this when it came out in 2022. We didn't have really a lot of positive things to say about it. It was just bland, especially for the money that they spent. I mean, the Christ, the amount of money that was spent on this show. And for it to just be pretty mediocre at the end of it. it was really disappointing uh but i found myself actually looking forward to the next season for whatever reason i don't actually can't explain it to you yeah the rings of power now that we've had the reveal as to who uh sauron is how is that going to um affect the lands of middle earth and are we going to see a sealed doors rise and fall really looking forward to this one I think it's going to be a slightly more epic. Hopefully they've got a little bit more of that uh, dirt under the fingernails level of detail that I really like to see in my fantasy shows. And hopefully a little less bright. Just just, just dial the brightness and the lighting. Just get the lighting right. Just dial it down a little bit. Because everything, it's like there's fucking sunlight everywhere. Just there's not. Sunlight doesn't have to be everywhere. Anyway, the Rings of Power. No one else put Rings of Power Season 2 on the list then, hey? Eh? I, I suppose. It wasn't really sold on the first season. You've not really talked about it, so not a fan of the first season then, Ben? No, nor was I. I, no, I nor was I. No, I wasn't. Uh, and I get the feeling that Jose wasn't as well, because I just like steamrolled over what he was saying there, but I have a feeling he was uh, on my page there. I would say I was not impressed. Uh, I, I wanted to like it more, and I was waiting for it to... like. It felt like a slow burn that never really got anywhere. I mean, it was that one big burn when the whole Mount Doom got created. I thought that was really cool. I think, I think the problem with it was um, it's always going to be hard to like make new Lords of the Rings stuff. And there just wasn't like... Also, the fact it was literally coming out head-to-head every week with House of the Dragon. Yes. Oh, that was and bad scheduling, wasn't it? It's just bad, bad. Even though they were on like, streaming services, they were still coming out. Like I think, I think uh, yeah, Rings of Power was on Fridays and House of the Dragon was on Sunday nights. But mm-hmm. I enjoyed both shows, but for very different reasons. I think House of the Dragon was better acted and better scripted. I thought the story was better there because it yeah. was smaller and much insular. Uh, whereas Rings of Power, I don't think the acting was as good. It had a quite a quite a relatively unknown cast in it. You know, I think they clearly spent all their money on the rights and a budget. But I would say I think in scale and epicness, I think it beat House of the Dragon because I think it just looked amazing. It just oh, yeah. didn't have. It just didn't grab me in the same way. But I, I persevered with it, and I did really enjoy it as it went on. I thought um, 
what's her name? I can't remember the main actress's name. She's a Welsh actress. She was in St. Maud. Uh, she was amazing as like the younger Gladriel. And like, you know, I just, I, I did like the show as it went on, but I, I will be watching season two. I'm quite, quite, quite there for it. I mean, I think I'm going to be on the boat where it's, I'm going to watch it and think it's just fine. You're going to watch it on a boat? <laughs> yes. I'm going to watch it on a boat and think it's just fine. <laughs> just, just fine. I didn't, I didn't even get to, I, I got maybe two or three episodes into the, the last the first season i don't i just i did, didn't care about it it just didn't grab me i was like i i really love the movies like i even liked the like the hobbit and those ones that everybody else hated like I thought, I thought i thought they were all good but this like this series just hasn't like and i don't know if it's like if, if it's part of like the rebel in me that's like it's the most expensive series ever made yeah, for like, me. you know so like that just makes me instantly want to go nah fuck jeff you. bezos like, has given you adverts now on amazon prime to make this show yeah, because why? Because fuck that guy. Like, I mean, come on, man. Like, like what? I just get in the sea. But like the the sheer <laughs> fact that they spent all that money on this series and it just sort of and it was just fine. It like Danny Henry they, was in it. I stand by my point. Um, like you don't. <laughs> you, there was nothing like if you're going to make the the most expensive series ever made, make it amazing. Make it I, the most expensive series ever made. I will say, as I'm somebody who watched the whole first series, what I liked is. After you kind of did the initial oh, did watch setting the end up, of it. sorry, I just remembered all the um, the Gandalf stuff. I did watch the end of it. Sorry, carry on. Well, I, I was about to say what the show kind of does. It, Quote, unquote Gandalf. Yeah. So what the show does, I, what I liked about it is it kind of got going. Was it set up this? Mm. Is someone going to be Sar- Sauron? Is someone going to be Gandalf? And oh, we don't know who it's going to be. And so it had this kind of okay. Well, I, I need to keep watching because I want to find out who it is. And I just, I, again, I thought visually it was amazing. It looked like the money was on the screen there. They had clearly spent it on it, just looking absolutely amazing. And that was enough for me, to be fair. Also, I was probably one of the few people who didn't spot the creation of Mount Doom. And then, like, when the little subtitle came up, I was like, Mordor. I was like, oh, fuck yeah, I loved it. And <laughs> apparently, apparently, a lot of other people were like, no, that's shit. It was just so obvious. But if you gave that, if you gave that budget to someone that like loves their craft and does it like you know like and has like an original idea, do you think they would have that made a better series? Potentially, like, give but... that give that budget to Ta- Taika Waititi. You know what I mean? Like and and, get, and say right, you can make anything you want, anything you want. Have that budget. You know what I mean? Like would I think I that's what that's what disappoints me about this is that it like it's and I'm going to keep harping on about it. It's the most expensive series ever made, and it was just all right. Yeah, yeah. It's still it was better than the Wheel of Time. So that's a come on bar is low there, my friend. <laughs> yeah, that's like kicking a head. You're horse. better than the wheel of time, and that ain't saying much. Oh, <laughs> oh, I feel like man. I'm on the wheel of time. You are, wheel of time. <laughs> you are the wheel of time. You are the wheel of time, and Your wheeling on. The wheel of time. Oh, oh, no need for that, Jose. <laughs> and wheeling on to your number seven, Ben. I don't want to talk now after that. Uh, my number seven. Oh, I've gone for something much more jovial and 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 fun. I've gone for Ted, the TV series. Uh, so Ted, the uh, the incredible prequel to Father Ted. No, sadly not. What when he was a when he was in a punk band before he yeah, became a be... before he became a, a priest. Yeah. Uh, no, this awesome. is this is the Seth MacFarlane uh, prequel series to the the two Ted movies that came out um, with with Marky Mark himself, Mark Wahlberg, um, in. Ted, the series, it's 1993 and Ted's moment of fame has passed, leaving him living with his best friend, 16-year-old John Bennett, uh, who lives in a working-class Boston home with his parents and cousin. Ted might not be the best influence on John, but when it comes right down to it, Ted is willing to go out on a limb and help his his friend and his family. Now, this to me, like it it, it seems like it's going to be really close to the movie, but you're going to get a lot of the, the grounding in some of their in-jokes and their, like, their nonsense and the stuff that they get. But also just Ted in itself is uh, another really successful Seth MacFarlane property because it's hilarious. Everything he does is just brilliantly funny because it's it it's based in like, you know, real life. It's observational and it's and he like Seth MacFarlane is so very clever that he can make like almost seamless, like make his comedy feel seamless, like and, you know, and effortless. Like, you know, like he's 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 fantastic. Everything that he's done from um from family guy to uh, american dad into orville which i watched all of again recently with my girlfriend um like it it's just brilliant like it's so good and like if i, I just can't see this being bad and that's what makes me excited about it it's just even 
even if it's got a weak episode here and there um you know like one of my like one of my go-to movies when i'm like you know stuck on a tour bus in the middle of nowhere is uh, a million ways to die in the west which is like a really forgettable movie for a lot of people but it's so funny like it's ridiculously funny and this like uh, like the stuff you can get away with by having an imaginary friend like you know like a, a real life teddy bear like the the, the the shit he gets away with in the movie is hilarious like a series where it's going to be like slightly uh it can be a little bit more risque and push the boundary a little bit more i'm just i'm just i'm all in it makes me great well ben i have some good news for you because the first two episodes arrive on the in the uk on sky and now tv tonight as we record this i am going to watch them at 9 p.m., so hopefully we'll be done recording by then. <laughs> well, you, yeah, well, we're going to have to be because you've got a peak to date with yourself that you've, that's very important. I definitely have. have. You, you have to, and have to Jose, make. the whole series is available to watch on Peacock in the US. Yay. Peacock, something that we don't have in the UK. Yeah, we do. We've got loads of them. Oh, dear. And from a Peacock <laughs> to Jose's number seven, there is no segue there at all. Not at all. I'm just going to say it. The regime, it has Kate Winslet in it and... It's uh so one thing that I really like to to uh, push right off the bat the showrunner is Will Tracy, who also wrote The Menu, Succession, oh. and last week tonight tonight with John Oliver. So already you know this is going to have witty writing and it's it's a satire of political intrigue. And I've seen the trailer again. I base a lot of this on trailers that I've seen because I think what you write down in an article versus what's actually on the show really makes a difference. And the political satire on this. Is hilarious, and I'm not much for political satire. Uh, uh, well, after Mayor of East Town, I think Kate Winslet could write her own ticket at HBO. And with this, she plays the dictator of an authoritarian regime in a made-up European country that is going to slowly crumble over the course of a year. So I think that's what the like the arc of the show is going to be, yeah. like this kind of like documentary or mock doc about this just country imploding on itself. Uh, the trailer debuted about six months ago now, and Winslet was just in full C-word shouting fury. Any any trailer where she calls someone a cunt, they're, yeah, they're going to be there for it. Uh, you had journalists being rounded up. You've got a really good supporting cast. You've got Matthias Schoenart. You've got Martha Plimpton, Hugh Grant, and, and Andrea Riseborough. Uh, yeah, this is just going to be, like you said, with, Jose, with the, the people who are writing this and showrunning this, I feel like this could be like the next... Um, the natural progression of like something like Succession or Veep. This is like the yes. next kind of yeah. show like that, I think. So if you want biting political satire, The Regime. Well, that brings us to my number seven, Jose. And that is a show that is actually on now that started uh, about three, four weeks ago. And that is season four of True Detective, subtitled Night Country. And uh, it's safe to say this show is massively back on form after only okay seasons in two and three. Obviously, season one is one of the great debut seasons of TV of all time, written by Nicholas Pizzolatto, a star in Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrison. While original creator Pizzolatto is credited as an exec producer, he has clearly stated he has nothing to do with the new series and isn't a fan, which I'll get to in a minute. So, firstly, season four is showrun and written by a Mexican writer-director called Isa Lopez, and it stars Jodie Foster as Liz Danvers, a genuinely unliked police chief in the small town of Venice, Alaska. That's a made-up town, Jose, because we've I checked the map. It doesn't exist. <laughs> also, it said it doesn't exist in the thing. The town is in this constant period of night. So she has to investigate when a full research team of scientists go missing and a former partner of hers called Navarro played by ex-world champion boxer Kelly Rice, believes it connects back to an old cold case. Um, the show also stars Finn Bennett, Fiona Shaw from Andor, John Hawkes, and Christopher Eccleston. So uh, it's a hell Stacked. of a show, man, already. Stacked. The, the original season of, uh, of True Detective was truly outstanding, with McConaughey uh, and Harrelson just absolutely double-teaming the screen. It was It was ridiculous. Like it was, yeah, you're right to pull that face. It was, I meant, I meant that as it sounded, but like, I haven't been drawn into this season at all. Like it, how many it, episodes are you, are you up to date on it? I, I haven't even, I haven't even bothered started watching it. Like I'm not even, I know. I, and I know, and I, I know I will watch it at some point, but there's no, like, like, I think it was the sleeper element of, um, of the original season where it was kind of like everyone's, you know, it was advertised heavily, but it wasn't really. Um, lauded everywhere and all of a sudden I just I mm. went oh, I'll give it a watch and I felt like I was discovering something new whereas this season I, I think I expect too much from it so I need I, I'm going to wait for it all to drop I'm and gonna, then binge like, and, and then binge it yeah well let me say man right so season one it kind of flirted with the supernatural vibe didn't it as you're watching it you're like is it yeah, supernatural yeah, yeah. or can it be explained a witch in places right yeah 
And well, let me say, season four so far takes a big leap into feeling like a mix of The Thing and Fortitude. Whoa. Okay. Another link with uh, Eccleston being in the cast as well. Okay, um, like I say, you have an incident at an Arctic research station. You got, you know, if you if you ever seen a show called uh, Fortitude, Jose, I have not. But it's a British show the thing. that's really worth seeking out, and it's kind of rig. no, that was the rig. Oh yeah, the that's rig. Right. That was terrible. I had that idea for a film fifteen years ago, and my idea was better. I'm just saying. I watched it, and I was not impressed. Anyway, get back to True Detective <laughs> season four. Hashtag yeah, give Neil it, money for a CV show. Yeah, let me let, let me write the rig and make it better. Um, so yeah, this is like a mix so far of the thing, you know, Arctic Research Station, people disappearing, people going mad and crazy, people having visions because it's endless night. There's ghosts, there's polar bears, there's corpsicles. <laughs> there's ghosts, there's polar bears. It's got everything. It's got everything, man. <laughs> and look, I'm really enjoying it. And what apparently made Jodie Foster like uh, sign up for it? What the way they pitched it to her was money. Imagine if well, money, money, <laughs> and giving her the lead in the show. And because she actually said at one point she had trouble getting into films now because no one wanted to cast like a elder, mid, elderly, middle aged woman in the lead role in anything anymore, oh. which is stupid because she's Jodie Foster so, and she's fantastic in everything. Freaking Jodie Foster, yes. And um, she's amazing in it, but they pitch it to her as right. So if you imagine Clary Starling 20 years down the line, having been through a lot of shit over the years, that's kind of where we want you to pick up the character. Oh, interesting. And that. so she is so manipulatively acerbic in it every other word is fuck or some variation of it she's just an absolute asshole to everyone in it and weirdly this show's had a really divisive response from fans and critics critics generally seem to love it and think it's the best thing since season one but it's been getting a lot of review bombing because some fans and yes it's the basement dwellers again uh, oh, okay. they don't like it because it's a woman running the show and improving on what the original guy created and obviously Pilizato, Pizzolato, piece of shitto, he's been quite negative about the show online, saying he has nothing to do with it and it's dumb. Mate, you're still credited as a fucking exec producer on the show. You're still getting money off the show. So perhaps don't be such a dick about it. You know, yeah. for me, it's yeah. a great creepy show that really still walks a line between everything having a rational explanation or something being supernatural. The cast is superb, but for me and Ben, this is what might draw you in. Lopez is trying to link season one to season four. Oh, oh, clever. That's cool. And we can't really judge how this is going to pan out until you get to the end of the season and see where it's going to go. Um, nice. I would say, I, I think if you're watching this and really enjoying it, go back and rewatch season one in tandem, um, which I'm going to start doing because I miss so much. I like, you know, I go on the forums afterwards and, you know, go on the Twitter and like, it was like, Do you, oh, this bit, that, that bit was from season one. This bit's connected. I was like, I did, that just went right by me. So if you haven't seen <laughs> any of it, you'll enjoy it and it'll be fine. And it's a really good, creepy. Uh, is is uh, this really of... only the fourth season? I feel like there's been a lot of. No, it's only the fourth, man. It's only four. Mahershal mm. Ali was in one season, right? Yeah, that, he yeah, was in season was... three. The and then season. before that, was that uh, Colin Farrell? Colin Farrell and Rachel McAdams. And uh, the guy oh. from Friday Night Lights who's been in loads of bad stuff. And it's not really his fault. Um, and that was all one funny. season. I didn't that realize. was all one season, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, True Detective. I think you'll like it. And if you don't, well, go. We'll take a walk out in the ice. Go bugger off. Whoa. Is that a bad word? Uh, uh, it's like going uh, to tell someone to eat their shorts. That brings us on to David's number six. And it is a show that actually is on, I think, a lot of our lists. For the first time. Yay. Synergy. Number six on my list is one of only two shows that are actually new coming out this year on my, on my list. And that's, uh, the, well, we've already heard the free body problem. And the second new show is Fallout. Uh, coming to uh, uh, Amazon Prime April 12th. I loved, I think like a lot of people like loved the video games. The video games are fucking, they were really immersive uh, and just the, uh, how, like how you were living in this sort of weird post-apocalyptic future alternative world where it was like everything was the 60s but it was like if the 60s if the Cold War had never ended and nuclear war had happened and then everything just gets bombed and everyone goes into bunkers and then now there's like radiation and mutants and bandits and if i didn't know that uh the westworld creators were working on it i probably wouldn't be as looking forward to it as much as i am but i uh, i think this has got the potential to be one of the best shows of the year cheddar agrees one of the in fact there you go that's it cheddar agrees best show of the year fallout 
So finally, a show that I think is on most of our lists as well, and that is Fallout. Not on mine. Is it not on yours? Nope. Is it on yours, Jose? It actually is on mine, but I figured you guys would know much more about this. Well, let me tell you, Jose. (laughs) Yep, it's not long till we get our vote on. Bethesda Software's AAA-rated video game series Fallout is heading to Prime Video in April. And the logline is, the show depicts the aftermath of an apocalyptic nuclear exchange in an alternate history where advances in nuclear technology after World War II led to the emergence of a retro-futuristic society and a subsequent resource war. The survivors took refuge in fallout bunkers known as vaults, built to preserve humanity in the event of nuclear annihilation. Because bunker was too difficult for them to, to get their heads around, was it? Two centuries later, a young woman named Lucy, played by Yellow Jackets Ella Purnell, a descendant of the original vault dwellers, leaves behind the only life she has ever known to venture out into the dangerously hostile and savage wasteland of Los Angeles. Oh, a devastated Los Angeles, not Los Angeles. The show also stars Walton Goggins as a ghoul, and his character is awesome, man. He's kind of like this mutated gunslinger slash bounty hunter who's been alive since before the bombs fell. So go figure that one out. He's, that means he's over 200 years old. And uh, Carl McLaughlin's in it as well as Hank, uh, the father of the main character. And he's like the overseer of the vault. So, mm-hmm. right, who here has played the games? I have not. No. But it just looks like a good show. Honestly, it does. So the good thing about this, this is like the reverse of The Last of Us. Whereas The Last of Us had this amazing story and brilliant narrative beats that you people just wanted to see recreated, Fallout doesn't really have that. Every game has kind of got a similar setup where you wake up from a vault and you go out into the wasteland and there's all these different warring factions and you decide which one you want to join and which ones you want to wipe out. So the main, and it's just such a really richly detailed world that you're not really too fussed about the overlying plot line in the games. It's more like, this is fucking awesome. I'm going to go fight some giant radiated scorpions. Oh, look, there's a cult of people who worship radiation. And they're all like, there's a bunch of people with their faces falling off called ghouls. Oh, they're like zombies. Cool. Uh, oh, there's a there's a bunch of military types called the Brotherhood of Steel. Oh, yeah, they're going to try and shoot me. Let's run away. There's a cyborg storyline in the games. And so this show is not going to follow any of the game lines, storylines, because it doesn't need to. It can tell an original story set within that world. I think, like you say, the overall world of this story is much more interesting than what you would get trying to adapt the games oh you've got so many different like factions let me, let me get oh, oh. oh. That's, a, that's a neil seal of approval if ever i've heard one. <laughs> oh, okay well look mate you've got giant monsters called super mutants you've got irradiated giant scorpions like scorpion up you know, transformer that keeps reminding me of a, of a red dwarf joke um yeah irradiated haggis but carry on irradiated haggis Think cyber marines. Think like the guys from Aliens, but with like more tech. They were, they were space marines. No, space Who are? Marine. Let's shoot stuff. But what makes this show really exciting is the team behind it. And it's Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, who previously made the very underrated person of interest and the much more critically acclaimed, but eh, Westworld. They're the showrunners. Fucking so, love um, person of interest. I know, and it doesn't get enough. T- and it went from being a procedural to fucking the Terminator, the TV series, pretty much. Oh, it was, it, and, and, what? And, and better than most of those things put together. But like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you. But then Westworld was really good, but uh, it kind of tailed oh, off. Man, yeah. I had such promise at the start. I think I checked out somewhere during season two. I saw season two, and then I was just like, oh, I'm man. done. I like the old timey versions of modern songs, but that was it. There's a really good version of Heart Shape. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> But um, yeah, so the main trailer's dropped and um, it looks like they're on the right track so far. So Fallout comes to Amazon Prime on April 12th. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Right, so Ben, that brings us to your number six, which is? My number six is another another one of the uh, Star Wars spin-off TV shows, Skeleton Crew, which we have already talked about. I don't really have anything else to add to it, so we can just skip forward on to the next number six, which is, I, I believe is my buddy Jose. Jose, what do you have at number six? I have Fallout. Which we've also just talked about. Okay. Yes. What? Speeding up. Speeding up. Well, that brings us on to my number six. So after what seems like years and years, we are finally getting a reduced second season of HBO's Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon, which I believe only eight episodes this time instead of the ten that we got in season one. But, um, yeah, it's Greens versus Blacks as hair to the throne, Emma Darcy's Raniera Targaryen, pursues her claim to the throne and her vengeance for her son, Nucheris. He got dragon munched at the end of season one. Oh, dragon munched. Dragon munched. It sound, doesn't sound much better. The title of the sex tape. 
Tightly sitting. <laughs> Versus Olivia Cook scheming, scheming, scheming. Queen Alison, not forgetting Matt Smith's delightfully psychotic Prince Damon. I mean, look, season one was excellent, right? And he had superb writing, great performances. But one of the problems, I think, we have two of the best characters in season one are no longer there, and, and actors. So you've got Paddy Constantine, who's no longer around as King Viserys, and uh, Millie Alcott, who was amazing as uh, the younger Raniera. They just jumped forward you know, a few years. Oh, by the way, new actress. And uh, you know what? I'm sure other characters are going to step up to the plate in season two, which yeah. Matt Smith recently let slip should be with us in August. So get ready for some House of the Dragon in August. There we go. Millie Alcock, by the way, is now cast as Supergirl. Yes. I'm I'm not uh I'm okay with it. Yeah, it's, fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's just fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm I'm a bit more no, on fine. Nothing I... against her acting. I, I guess I was just ex- expecting a taller actress. That's all. Talk, like that's a weird heel that to die on. Very <laughs> odd. Are you one of those guys that like like goes on a date with a girl and then like oh like she had like she like her hair wasn't the right kind of brown for me. Like I'm out. You know what? Like, if it's not <laughs> You sound like an episode of Seinfeld. She had man hands. <laughs> oh, what was it? Uh, I was thinking that one, uh, sh- that movie with uh, Jack Black and Gwyneth Paltrow. Shallow Hal. Shallow Hal. Shallow Hal. With yeah, that's what I was going for right there. It's amazing. Good reference. Okay, well, let's get it on. We're half. We're at the halfway mark, which is Woo-hoo! good. And you enjoy your your pizza day. It's fucking tantalizing. Oh, I can smell the pepperoni. Then <laughs> I can smell it. Uh, at number five on David's list, what do you have, David? And my number five, we're getting into the top five. And this year, the like the top five, of, personally for me, I found it so difficult to separate any of them. Because each one of these could have been my number one and might end up being my number one show at the end of the year. Uh, but I had to figure out some way of separating them. So coming in at number five is the second season of Squid Game. Squid Game... Uh, was number five, I uh, put it below the others because I was slightly worried about it as well. Mainly because the whole, like, I love the games and I love the storylines and uh, within the games. And the part of the story that I didn't like was the whole, like, rich man, businessman, billionaire benefactors that are all paying to watch it happen. I felt like that was like, oh, look at me, I'm getting sucked off whilst uh, I have a fucking cougar mask on. Uh, it just wasn't interesting to me. And I fear that we're going to go more down that route. And it's going to be less about the games and more about the business and the people behind the games. Uh, so, yeah, that's my only concern. But I uh, really enjoyed Squid Game. I even enjoyed Squid Game The Challenge that came out this year. Not last year, 2023. So, Squid Game, my number five. Yeah, Squid Game Season 2. Um, Now, this new trailer dropped the other day and I looked at it and I was like, isn't that just the end scene from the first series? Like, I don't think there was any new footage in it from what I saw. I didn't realise there was a trailer mm. for it. Oh, I'm going to have to go and watch that. Yeah. So um, I, I, love, well, I, love season, I love season one. I thought it was great. And it was like one of those things where, you know, me, like, I'm stubborn to the last and I'm just like, no, oh, this thing's getting all hyped up. I don't want to fucking watch this, says the guy that loves <laughs> all of Star Wars, all of Marvel and everything that, you know, like is, is hyped <laughs> beyond all belief. But that's fine because I came to it on my own when I was a kid. But... Like when something gets hyped to that level, like I feel like, especially on Netflix, like we all fell for Tiger King or what the fucking nonsense that was. Like oh, yeah. Tiger King, yeah. I, Mate, I'm it was like, during the pandemic. There wasn't a lot to watch, you know. I know we all lost our collective I... minds, but like at the same time, like like something about like the the hype on a Netflix show makes me back off a little bit. And the first season of Squid Games did that for me. But then I went, I actually went and watched it on my own terms. I thought it was fucking brilliant. So um, I'm mm. I'm on board for this one. I think it could be a lot of fun. I was I, I drove past the studio the other day and it was a massive Squid Games um, thing outside the the studio where they're shooting it in LA, and it just it got me excited. I was just like, let's do it. Well, Ben, speaking of excited, what have you got? Are you number five? What me? This guy? I don't know about that. Uh, number five. Uh, right. I've got something that we're going to talk about later on, so I'll tell you what it is now, but I think we should talk about this a little bit later on because it's on both of your lists. It's The Boys, the uh, Amazon Prime superhero with gore, like, you know, special. Extra gore. uh, Super extra gore. Like, I've put it at number five because there's other things that I want to talk about, but it is it does deserve to get, like, all of us weighing in on it properly. All right, uh, Jose, so this brings us to your number five. My number five is actually a continuation of a season two that started last year. It is Invincible Season 2, Part 2. 
And for the record, it comes out March 14th. Woohoo! So a little bit of waiting, but it's coming around. I'm really excited. The show, again, is not for kids. It's another cartoon uh, based kind of almost in a way of spoofing comic books, but not really. It's it's just a really smart way. Not Because I feel like The Boys actually spoofs comic books more. The Boys is a graphic novel. But this is just like a, an adult comic book cartoon that really in- introduces some good characters and uh, it plays on them a little bit better. And what a voice cast, man. Oh, yeah. Stephen yeah, Yoon, I mean, J.K. Simmons, man. It's J.K. Simmons. Seth Rogen. Like, yeah, it's just, it's it's a great show. Although, Jose, I have a bone to pick with season two of it so far. Oh, go for it. Why'd you split it into two parts, you utter bastards? Like, I was like, every Friday, yeah, new Invincible. <laughs> then it wasn't on. I was like, oh, perhaps I've just taken it off because it's Christ- Christmas is coming up. No, it's still not on. Every week, Jose, every week. Checking, I know. Checking. It's not there. Now I have to wait another month. They didn't even tell us, I don't think, until like it actually stopped. And then I'm like, what's going on? I Googled it and like, oh, there's a season one, two break. And I'm like, oh, come on. And everyone guys. in the rest of the world was like, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. We don't have that. We I just need... air shows normally. I know, right? I need more of my fix. <laughs> but yes. So March 14th, we'll get that fix. And um, I, I think it stopped in a pretty decent spot. It, it had a nice little cliffhanger. And uh, for those who know what's going to happen, because they read the graphic novel it don't, it's don't tell us yeah don't tell us you utter bastard don't actually, tell us i actually in... haven't watched the first part of this season two because i'm waiting for it all to come out so i can binge it like a proper person oh, yeah which i didn't realize if you told me and i would have waited as well i, I had no idea it was going to happen i just didn't i just didn't no, not you personally I, ben i meant i, I meant... didn't watch oh god no i'm so sorry um but uh, i didn't watch <laughs> i didn't watch episode one when it came out and everybody started talking about it and i was like oh you know what i'll binge it when it all comes out and then it wasn't until you guys mentioned that it had been split in two that I went, oh, fuck it, I'll wait until it all comes out. Yeah. Yes. That's all I'm going to say. Cool, 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 cool. Right, well, that brings us on to my number five. And cue the Defiant Jazz. It's time for Severance, Ooh. season two. <laughs> Amazing. I don't know if that's jazz, but... <laughs> hey, you were freestyling, Jose, and uh, that will Anything do. It will jazz. do. Everything's jazz. I'm almost certain Severance was our show of 2022, and it's been a long two-year-plus wait for season two. And as such, if you've forgotten what Severance was about, well, you've probably gone up in the elevator. Smooth. Excellent work. (laughs) Yes. Flawless. So, yeah, basically, (laughs) biotech corporation Lumin uses a medical procedure called Severance to separate the memories of their employees, depending spatially on whether they're at work or not. So if you're a severed worker at work, you're dubbed an innie, and you can remember nothing of your life or the out- world outside. When the outside work, they're dubbed outies and can't remember their time at work. Due to this innie and outie experience, there's two different lives kind of going on with distinct personalities and agendas. And season one focuses on one severed employee, Mark, played by Adam Scott, who gradually uncovers a web of conspiracies at Lumen and a mysterious project the employees are unknowingly working on. And in the very first scene of episode one, we're introduced to Britt Lauer's Heli R, a newly severed employee. And a lot of the early episodes kind of, we see it through her eyes as a newbie being inducted into the world of Lumen, pretty much against her will. Basically, like she's, we see it through her eyes and like that, the world of Lumen and the viewer slowly, as she starts to piece together what's going on, we start to piece together what's going on as well. The cast are amazing in this. Adam Scott, uh, is brilliant as like the kind of co-lead Mark S and the great Christopher Walken and, and John Turturro. They have such an amazing storyline in it as well. And that's before you get walking to the, here. The, you know what? I'm just Chris, walking here. Christopher Walken is one of those uh, um, impersonations that I wish I could do. But the only thing I, yeah. the only thing I've ever heard him say that I could copy is like when he says "Full Fighters." Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. Foo Fighters. <laughs> uh, also, he's, he'll always be infamous for the cowbell sketch as well, man. Oh, <laughs> my Beaver. God. I love that. Came oh, up, that came up the other day. Cowbell. It was so, yeah, I love that. <laughs> I imagine it comes up in, regularly in your line of work, man. Yeah. I mean, the Don't Fear the Reaper. Just, bum, you know, just bum, yeah, that's bum, genius. Bum, I, I'd say bum. one of the um, stars of the show that we hadn't heard of before was uh, Tramel Tillman, who plays like the steam stealing uh, overseer of their office, Milchek. Who's re- he's I've never seen a character be so menacingly polite. Like if he was a I remember saying this on the pod last time when we talked about the show. I said, if you could bottle his scent, it would be quiet menace. Ooh. Quiet menace. Quiet menace. Quiet and of course you've got Patricia Arquette exactly. as well. And uh, honestly, as I said, so much has happened that if you forgot over the course of season one, I'm actually gonna re spoil how season one ends because I would go and watch it again. I am gonna go and watch it again. Yeah, I think um, I'm gonna watch it for the first time. And if you haven't watched it for the first time, Watch it now. Make it your priority before Apple drops season two at some point this year. And we see you, Apple TV, being 
sneaky, posting your severance clips on your socials. Does that mean it's coming back really soon? Or does it just mean you've started filming it again? Well, actually, sadly, I did see one of those clips. And uh, I think it was just confirmed it's only just started being filmed again. So, again, this might slip to 2025. Oh, man, we're going to get in so much trouble with the Dungeon Dwellers. Oh, man. I hate the Dungeon Dwellers. I don't know any of them, luckily. Yeah, I don't live in a dungeon. Because I go out with Twitterverse in the real world. Well, that brings us to number four. And uh, David, what do you have at number four? My number four spot, like I said, these top five are really difficult to separate. And I went with uh, The Boys season four. Now, I know some of you are probably going to have this higher up on your list, so I won't speak much on it. But, yeah, really looking forward to seeing more Homelander just being a complete fucking psychotic piece of shit. You know, at the end of the, the, episode, at the, end of the last um, season, you know, where he, he laserized the protester and uh, everyone's just like, yeah, fucking let's go. And it's that meme that we've seen every day for the last year or whenever it came out hopefully we get a little bit more of that some more meme content hopefully get a little bit more um squid sex don't know why i said i wanted more of that you know what the boys does to you it gets you liking shit that you didn't know you were into ben what is your number four four uh number four for me is uh hump day no wednesday that's just a day uh... of the week is this like the 30 seconds to mars thing no no (laughs) that's not it's not a measurement of time it's not measurement of time. Uh, nor nor will I entertain this nonsense any longer from you, young man. Uh, no, Wednesday. The uh, shut up. <laughs> the the Timber story of a sleuthing supernatural infused uh, mystery charting Wednesday Adams's years as a student at Nevermore Academy. Uh, it, it's. Uh, I mean, the sheer fact that Tim Burton is doing this is is, is truly fantastic. Um, so Wednesday attempts to master her emerging psychic ability, thwart various killing sprees and solve supernatural mysteries, all while navigating her new, very tangled relationships at Nevermore. Um, this season has been rumoured to have less teen drama and will lean more into the horror aspect of the Adams family, from what I understand. Mm. And I am all in. It's, I mean, season one was glorious. Wherever they go with this, it doesn't really matter too much to with, to me because it's it's engaging, it's fun, like it's, it's great cast. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the cast is ridiculously good, but also, I mean, I mean, it's got it's got something for like someone of my age as it as it has for something of my like my niece and nephew's age. There's like there's something for everybody in here, and I don't, and I think that that's that, something that's truly got that. In my dad the, watched it. My dad actually enjoyed it. Watched the whole thing. There you go. So I mean, like, like it, it's rare family. that you you get that. I mean, like, you know, Pixar are nailing it with their like something for everybody. You know, we used to have The Simpsons, which was like had like the in jokes of the adults and the fun stuff for the kids, but you you don't anymore. And I think Wednesday is the the thing for me that does that the best right now. Do you know? Do you know with Wednesday what I felt when I was watching it? It reminded me in the way of the cast dynamics and the plotting and everything. It reminded me of old school Buffy. In yeah, the best too. possible way, hundred percent. Oh, hundred okay. percent. That's, that's yeah. a huge compliment, right there. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think, I think, um, like Buffy on its on its best day is untouchable, but like, but Wednesday is the is like the nearest thing you're gonna you're gonna find to that kind of style of of quirky teen, like out of place teen in a in an environment where you would think they would be very uh, like comfortable. So like Wednesday going to the Nevermore Academy where everybody's like got some sort of superpower. She's still the outsider of the outsiders, and that's what Buffy had, and it. it it helps people like it helps people kind of like um, like gel with that character. I think quite quickly because we've all felt a little bit like that. But you know, Tim Burton absolutely smashed the first season. I don't think there was I don't think there was a bad episode, and uh, I'm just I'm super excited for this next this next season. I mean, it seems to be flying under the radar a little bit. Like Netflix aren't really pushing it as uh, as their main uh, thing because they've got a lot coming out this year. And I think Netflix, they don't kind of they're like oh, by the way, next week this is on, and everyone ah yeah. I think yeah, they're, 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 they're sales their tactic to get you to watch isn't like trail it for ages i think stuff they're not exactly yeah i think when there's something that they know is going to be a massive hit they just drop it and everyone's like it's out Ah!" and like everyone goes (laughs) crazy um i think stuff they don't have as much confidence in or a bit of a tougher sell they trail and promote more Mm. that's that sounds a lot to me like what i've seen of netflix over the last well definitely definitely four years so yeah i think that i think you're actually completely right there and it is not Wednesday as we record this. It is a different day of the week, and that doesn't in any way segue into what I was going to say next. So, uh, well done, yeah. excellent work. 
Terrible. All right, Jose, and that brings us on to your number four, which is... My number four, House of the Dragon. We've spoken about it, and I just want to say it is really good. I did not need to watch Game of Thrones to enjoy season one of House of the Dragon, but I did, and I, I'm really excited for season two. Has it made me want to watch Game of Thrones? I've always wanted to watch Game of Thrones, but it's just so overwhelming. It's just so much to take in. And I don't have anyone to be like, who is that character? What do they do? What's going on? You've, you've got uh, David's you know. cell phone number, right? Like, he yeah. will fucking, he will, <laughs> he will jizz all over text messages. If you ask him a single question, if you just say, who is Daenerys Targaryen? He will just fucking text wank all over your fucking phone. Like, you will, you will get so much, too much information. In fact, that's probably the most over, that's the most overbearing thing. In fact, just watch Game of Thrones. It's not that much to digest. Don't talk to David David about it because he will fuck it up for you. <laughs> his rat, his rage will come through about how it ended. <laughs> oh, no, that I already know through the memes and through the re- public reaction. I know the last two seasons are tough. Are the best. They, they... Fuck you, David. You're not here. <laughs> <laughs> and next up on our Game of Thrones um, spoiler special, fight to the death, co-host <laughs> Odd <laughs> Battle Royal. <laughs> David does have a sword, though. He actually has a sword signed by um, Sheriff Hopper, doesn't he? Yeah, I got there a lightsaber. There we go. Fuck off. So is... we need... Although Ben's probably got a lightsaber somewhere, so hey, you know. I've got a couple. Exactly. Of course you have. Right, well, that brings <laughs> us on to my number four. And... Fuck you. <laughs> You'd have lightsabers if you could find them and afford them, you bastard. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <dear. all> right. <laughs> we don't speak ill of lightsabers. How dare you. Well, after all the fallout from that, hey, hey, my number four is Ooh. Fallout. But we've, already hey. Talked, hey, but we've already talked about Fallout a lot, and we're going to jump ahead. And that brings us to David's number three. And David's number three, well, David, tell us, what is your number three? Uh, number three, top three. And now this one uh, was quite difficult to separate, but I had to put it at number three, because mainly because i kind of forgotten a little bit about the first season which is very ironic considering the show i'm on about is severance the team of workers that have to you know they lose their memory every time that they go to work and their personal lives and work lives are completely divided um that is like fucking nightmare imagine just leaving work and then being back at work again and then leaving work and going back to work again that's just that's just fucking the worst thing ever that could ever happen yeah, I, I I put this one at number three, mainly because I can't really remember. I feel like I've been severanced. I can't remember the the show that much. I just remember I really liked it. And that it, I think it was number one in my top shows of 2022 list. That's how much I enjoyed it. So I'm thinking I'm going to fucking love Severance Season 2, uh, which is why it's so high up on my list. I don't remember much of it, which is, which is weird. But I know I'm going to like it. And Ben, what do you have at your number three? My number three um, is something that uh, we are all going to talk about later on. Um, so I'm going to leave it until then, uh, because, again, I feel like uh, you guys have way, way better notes than me. But my number three is uh, season three of The Bear, yes. which I, is, is going to be phenomenal. And I left it off of my my favorites last year. It didn't like it didn't ping in my brain when I was writing my list. I was trying to do it without notes. Uh, and I and I realised how much of a faux pas that was. But I am very excited to see where the bear is going this year. All right. Well, Jose, what do you have at number three? My number three is Strange New Worlds. Okay. Um, I have no idea what's going on. I just love the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's, really, that's really what comes down to it. That's that's really honestly the, the what what my top three is. Well, Jose, I love the show. We have the same number three. My number three is also Star Trek: Strange New World season three, which we might get some episodes off this year. It's being it's they are filming right now, and um, mm. yes, this was the second of our joint best shows of last year, and uh, production is going to run till May on it though. They are going to be filming until May, so I think like the ultimate us getting any new Strange New Worlds this year are pretty slim, although. There is a rumour mm. that they might split the season in two, which, like Invincible, I would fucking hate. But also, <laughs> I wasn't into Star Trek. Um, I wasn't into Strange New Worlds when season one and two originally came out. It was only after, I think, the last couple of episodes of season two were airing that I finally got into it. It was like, this is amazing. Why have, Why is this not in my life? I, 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 will, I will let them give me a few episodes before Christmas as a Christmas present. 
to do it, Paramount. Give us Star Trek Changing Worlds. So, yeah, season two ended on a hell of a cliffhanger with Pike and the Enterprise outgunned and outmatched by the Gorn and also being told by Starfleet to disengage. But the Gorn have taken Lieutenant Leon Noonan Singh, Dr. Joseph Mbenga, Lieutenant Erica Ortegas, and Lieutenant Sam Kirk, and several residents of Parnassus Beta as their prisoners. And there is no way a captain of the motherfucking Enterprise is going to follow orders when four of his main crew have been abducted. And also, you yeah. know Leanne is going to have definitely have some flashbacks because she's escaped the Gorn before. I hope, and I'm also fairly confident though, that, you know, this is Star Trek, right? You'll have a couple of episodes dealing with this big storyline. And then you're just going to, then the crew will be reunited, hopefully all alive still. And then Strange New Worlds will do what it does best, which is each episode given a different character, a different spotlight and jumping between genres. And that's just what makes the show, and that's just what makes the show so entertaining and accessible. Here, fucking here. Strange New Worlds yes. is one of those like is one of those shows that gives me like faith in TV again. Like it's just it it's so well done and it and it pays like the proper amount of credit to where like where it comes from, where it's going. Like it's stuck in this weird little like space of, you know, like yeah, at some point Kirk's gonna take over the Enterprise, but until then, you fucking watch how far we run with it with this thing. Like it's yeah. it it's done so well. I, I loved it. I, I mean it was one of my top shows last year. And if it doesn't come out this year, then that's ridiculous. But if they if if it's wrapping in May, like what? Like a, they'd need a three four month turnaround to really to really start putting episodes out. So by October, we we could we could start really seeing something. I mean, I I, I think at best we're going to get be December. And um, no. yeah, no, you're probably, way, right. you're probably right. That brings us on to number twos, and at number two, a surprise because for sure I thought David, this was going to be your number one show, and it's not. What is your number two? Oh. And here we are. We're at the final two. It's been a long ride with you both. Each of you, over to you. I just want to toast. Everybody, everybody get out of the glasses. Neil, to the top shows coming out this year. I should have probably done this at number one. It would have made more sense. Anyway, number two is House of the Dragon. The George R. R. Martin spin-off show of Game of Thrones coming in for its second season. From Fire to Fire is on the poster of this season. Uh, I've, for anyone that's read, you know, the Fire and Blood um, sort of history book uh, that George Martin wrote, uh, you'll know what's coming in this because the whole history has already been written. Let just trust me when I say, if you enjoyed the first season, the best is yet to come. It gets so epic, so bloody so traitorous it's um it i think it has the potential to be the number one show of the year and if they get if they just like if i have faith in them because they got it so right in the first season they're gonna get it right in the second season the um the special effects were like the dragons were amazing and i really just hope that they open this see this this season with a little bit of cheese and a little bit of blood because everybody likes a bit of cheddar. Don't they, cheddar? <whistles> cheddar? A bit of blood. Damn it. Messed it up. Blood and cheese. You know what I'm on about. If you know, you know. Well, holy fire breathing dragons. David only has House of the Dragon at number two. And we spoke enough about House of the Dragon, so we can swiftly move on to yes. your number two, Ben, which is... My number two is Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which we literally just finished talking about just before David said all that nonsense about that other thing that he was talking about. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, in that case, it means we can skip forward to you, Jose. And what is your number two? My number two is The Boys, which does have a release date of somewhere this year. <laughs> yes, we're all confident it's coming out. It's definitely coming out this year, unlike some of the other shows on our list, potentially. Although I, did, I keep seeing kind of like conflicting news if it's going to be late February, mid-March, or even early summer. So I, have you seen anything to actually kind of nail down a date? I have not, Jose, but... I have some information about the boys because it is also my number two. Hey, you guys. Yeah. Adorable. <laughs> and as we go into season four of the boys, the log line, the premise says, the world is on the brink. Victoria Newman is closer than ever to the Oval Office and under the muscly thumb of Homelander who is consolidating his power. Butcher, with only months to live, has lost Becca's son as well as his job as a boys leader. The rest of the team are fed up with his lies. With the stakes higher than ever, they have to find a way to work together and save the world before it's too late. You know, so standard. Now, hmm. the most recent yeah. trailer 
as always, looked excellent with Anthony Starr's homelander just going full Trump this season. And from the looks of the things, <laughs> Newman's bid for the White House is going to be the key plot line for this season. Also, added to the cast this season, Negan himself, Jeffrey Dean Morgan, uh, is going to be in as a new associate of Carl Urban's Buddy Butcher. And also, they have to tie in the Shen V arc to the boys' overall story as well. Now, look, I love the boys, and we're still a good few seasons away from reaching the end game if the show plans to have the same ending as the comic books. Yes, there have been massive changes, but usually they've been for the better. And I think the ending of the original comic is so perfect that I really hope we get to that point someday. Oh, yeah. mm. I mean, I, I know the ending of the comic as well, and they're definitely going to have to change it um, for reasons that comic readers know. Similar ending, but you're going to get to it differently is what I th- I'm saying. I think, the, I think there's... Because obviously one character's fate is very different um, yes. from the books. But I don't... That's not the main ending. That's a part of the end game of this... Of the, oh, of the series. Then I don't really know the ending. All then. this cryptic oh. stuff is really annoying me because I don't know this ending that you're talking about. So this is so rubbish. Stop talking about it right now, you pair of bastards. Okay, so the show has just done a really good job of updating <laughs> and and uh, making the the overall political and social satire really good. Well, it's Eric Kripke, right? It's Eric Kripke who did Supernatural for its mm. best seasons, the first five. And then they were like, oh, the show's really good. We're going to keep doing it. He's like, but that's the arc. Like, it, I've, I've, I've got no yeah, more to finished. write. Yeah, and um, and it's like okay, cool. He even cameo, he even cameoed in the later episode as himself as a writer. As a, which I remember that. It, was, it was so meta. It was so, it was it was really clever. Yeah. Um, and um, I I think what they do well is like you say um, because this is the second uh, Garth Ennis property that's been adapted to Amazon. They had a kind of dry run with Preacher, which was good, but mm. it. I feel like it wasn't nowhere near as good as the comics. But arguably, the comics did need to be updated a lot to reflect more sensibilities if they were going to make it. Uh, yeah. And I kind of I think, feel like I that think was... The, I, think, I think the excitement... Sorry to cut you off, but I think the excitement about Preacher was justified, but also people didn't think about that contextually. No. You, they didn't take... you, you know Because I remember you telling me about it back in the day. You were like, dude, I know you never read this, this graphic novel before or this comic, but like, it's fucking out of this world. Yeah. And, and I was like... And I was like, oh, cool, I'm into it. And so as I was watching it before I got visited the comics... I was like, oh, this is great, but it didn't hit the same because because society had moved on past the point where you were like like shocked by a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So like, yeah, so to your point, um, yes, Preacher was fantastic, but it didn't quite match up to the comics. Whereas this, they've done a really, really good they've job of it, switching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've they I think they learned a lot of lessons in that, in yeah. the, in, in how they switched like the context. Preacher stumbled so the boys mm-hmm. could run. Oh. Yeah. oh no. And the good news about the the boys is that oh, originally they kind of had an idea of how many seasons they wanted, but the writers have said they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot and they are going to extend where it makes sense. So cuz uh, I think Gen V was going to be a, a spin-off that would take over, but then they're seeing that both shows are doing so well that they're not just going to cut things off too early. Well, and also the original uh comic book of the boys, they've the Garth Ennis they started a new run following on years later from the end of the original thing. So oh, wow. if they wanted to, they could just go straight into that at some point. God, okay. Damn. I've actually not read it all because it's been released like tiny, tiny bit at a time. So it's like, I want I want a trade paperback with yeah. all of it in one go, please, before I oh, get back gosh. into it again. Have you ordered your pizza? Because the pizza is now ordered. Right. Nice. Um, hold, I say we've got to hold him up. We've got to hold him up as much as possible dicks. now. Don't be dicks. Oh, yeah, let's <laughs> keep talking about random things. And so this brings us to the number one slot. And David, what do you have for number one? And we're there. We finally made it. To the top of the hill. The number one. The numero uno show that we are most looking forward to this year. My show, gentlemen, is a show that might not have even made your lists. In fact, I think it only made one of yours. And that is the sixth and final season of Cobra Kai. I fucking love Cobra Kai. I love it for reasons I re- genuinely I struggle to explain. It is, it is fucking comedy. It's a perfect blend of comedy, action, uh, sort of fucking teen drama, which for some reason I enjoy, and nostalgia. I, I, the, the nostalgia thing's fucking strange as well because I don't even I don't really care for the Karate Kid. Like it's a fine film. Like I, like I enjoy it, but for some reason. I 
fucking really nostalgic watching this film. I'm not even from the 80s. Like, you know, I was born in the 90s. And yet I'm still really nostalgic about Cobra Kai. I don't know where they're going to go with this season as well, because the, I felt like season five ended in such a way where they could have just, they could have just finished it there. I felt like it was a, it was a good ending. You know, Cobra Kai is no more cause sort of thing. You know, Johnny Silver has been defeated. What are they going to do? But I feel like this season is going to more focus on the conflict between Johnny and John and Johnny and John, Johnny Lawrence and John Kreese and how they're going to, that's going to be like the main fight. And it's going to be Johnny finally defeating his demon. And uh, but I don't, I don't know what the f- conflict's going to be between the between all the kids that are now n- probably no longer ch- kids. They're more like thirty year old actors trying to play teenagers still. Uh, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen there. But I probably are actually mid twenties or something. These kids. Anyway, uh, I fucking love Cobra Kai. Really looking forward to it. And that is my top ten shows, guys. Cheddar, you're ruining this take. I'm not going to re-record it. No. Well, this brings us on to uh, your number one, Ben, which, in a shocking turn, isn't something we've talked about already or on any of our other lists. Yeah, because I know where it's at. Uh, my number one is the thing, definitely the thing that I'm most excited about this year is The Bad Batch, the final season of The Bad Batch. It's the uh, the Star Wars spinoff of The Clone Wars following um, Clone uh, Troop. Oh, I always get this wrong. Clone Troop 99. Uh, and they are like genetically enhanced clone troopers that have different skills. Um, and it's their adventure and how they resisted Order 66 uh, to go on to be like a, like a, a like almost an offshoot of the rebellion. Uh, the, I followed this since the Clone Wars. I love the Clone Wars TV show. Um, and when you first see these particular guys like going into battle and stuff, the episode's really fun. It's like it it it's so like a little bit of something for everybody, but it's also like it it took the idea of what a, a clone trooper, stormtrooper could be, and and expanded on it. And it gives everybody a little like gives every, each one of the the troopers gets their own little like you know uh, special power. Like you know, one of them's really strong. One of them's like a crack shot. One of them's like a really great tracker. Anyway. The story that I've watched over the last few seasons has been as engaging and as entertaining as anything I've ever seen in Star Wars. Like, there's a family unit, the Bad Batch, uh, the clone troopers are, like, it, again, it's it's a bit Mandalorian in, in that they have found a, a kid to look after. Like, most things in Star Wars is people, person with experience finds an experienced person and teaches them how to be experienced therefore good or bad happens uh the the the, where the bad batch uh are are left things off last season is really enticing as well they just lost tech like one of the like they've they they killed off one of the main characters in this show like it's like and it was and it was it is it is a spoiler for the last season but you know what like i don't think many people are going to be um too annoyed that i've said that uh mainly because most people with a soul have watched this show and know how <laughs> awesome it is um, <laughs> but no but like it's so yeah they they've they've killed off one of the major characters and it was such a heart wrenching like gut wrenching experience that like that like i have to know now how it all culminates and like i say i've watched it from from day what like day 1 and it's it's such a good well written series um and it's you know it's like hard i don't think there's been many episodes that i've been like bummed out on if any, and like the trailer for it has just come out all guns blazing, like absolutely, like balls to the wall, like just full on action. And I, I, I guarantee that that trailer is ninety percent like made up of the first episode as well, because they very rarely give stuff away. So yeah, I'm I can't. If you haven't watched the Clone Wars, don't worry about it. If you want to watch the Bad Batch, it's like this is like season four. Um, it, you, you... I was gonna say uh, I haven't watched any of the previous material, so. I was wondering how much of it i should need or if is it more of just like filler to help like understand or is it just separate stories uh well the the series the bad batch series um like when you if if you were to watch clone wars there's maybe two or three episodes in there that they they were in so it's like the introductory like i think it's a two-part or something that where they 
they do their mission. Uh, and then there's another one where they do like a like a featurette. So you do not have to have watched Clone Wars to enjoy no. the Bad Batch. I all. watched, I think, the first three or four, Jose, when it came out. And then, because um, it was on a week-to-week release thing, wasn't it? And I, mm. I waited until there was a few out. And then I, I binge-watched like three or four of them. And I was like, eh, this is good. And then stuff happened and I just never went back to it. It just That's didn't call me back. Mm. I would say, I would challenge you to watch bad batch again i honestly think that if you watch bad batch and it and you vibe with it it will it will make you want to go and watch clone wars if you haven't already watched clone wars because clone wars was fucking brilliant Mm. so uh so yeah you what i haven't watched clone wars get out your own podcast (laughs) um but but seriously i think i think if you give give bad batch uh, give bad batch a shot there's some really good cameos in there it it ties a lot of things together and i want to see how they wrap this whole thing up that's mainly Mainly for me, I guess the thing, the reason I'm so excited is because I want to see how they tie this whole thing together, put a bow on it, and be like, uh, like, be happy that you know that Star Wars is still happening and that this this show was so good. High praise. I don't think we can add anything to that. You fucking better not. <laughs> Mainly because, <we're, laughs> and uh, bizarrely, this brings us to Jose's number one and also my number one. So, on in a, in a pure kind of Vulcan mind meld thing, we've got exactly the same top three, mate. Yes, sir. And it can only be one show for us, and it is. Nothing was going to take the top spot away than The Bear, season three. The yeah. Bear. Now, the Bears. It's, it's funny, because since season two, Zed, and cleaned up at the Emmys recently, with six wins, bizarrely in the best comedy category, although, to be fair, they would have been steamrolled by succession in drama this year. So, you know, fair mm. enough. But there's been a lot more interest in the show, and not just because of the Emmys, but because Jeremy Allen White is uh, becoming a, 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 like a major star now. He was like... in. He's like brilliant alongside Zac Efron in the uh, the Iron Claw, uh, the wrestling film that came out uh, today in the UK as we record this. So go and see the Iron Claw. I saw a preview a few yeah. weeks back. It is amazing. It proves that Zac Efron can act, which some of us knew. And he is just I ironically, knew. he just like we always joke. I knew from Baywatch. He was well, great. we always joke about Zac Efron and that he like just did the easy role where he took his shirt off and was a hot guy with loads of muscles. And then he's ironically we'll do playing. It if you could Neil. Exactly. Yeah, we all would. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he's doing that now. But he's also in a really, really well-written, dramatic role and performance. And uh, it's a bit of a shame that he didn't get any Oscar nominations. Uh, the, the film didn't get any, I don't think. Also, large swathes of the population, mostly female, but, you know, guys as well, are also discovering the show in him because he's the star of a new Calvin Klein advert. So when I was up in London for the oh, theatre the yeah. other week, I was, like, walking past, like, Trafalgar Square, and it's just a giant four-storey billboard of, yeah, Jeremy Allen White in his pants. So, you know, he's becoming a very popular guy. He is, as you guys say, proper fit. Is that <laughs> not right? One of the women at work was like, I saw this guy and like, started saying about this show. And I was like, yeah, that's that's the guy from The Bear. Although then someone else said he looks like a he looks like a buffer version of young G. Milder. You're wow. right. You're right. And I was like, All well, right. if you're into that kind of thing. And she's like, I'm not. I was like, okay. Uh, so <laughs> where will season three take us? Well, we already did a spoiler special on both seasons of the show, which was, I believe, episode... 78 of We Need a Road. So if you want to know where we think season three is going to go and what we thought of season one and two, well, it's there. Go listen to it. I think it was you, me, and Jose before for that. So, uh, yeah. I forget what I said, but there has been speculation that goes back to more of just a regular kitchen procedural where they, they look at what the process, but then they focus more on a different character. Yeah, chef. One article I looked at was uh, FAK. F-A-K. 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 Fact. Neil, uh, fact. they they want to they want to show off his character arc a little more because he's probably one of the the characters who probably didn't get as much screen time and or character development. He was I in Andor. That's a good idea. Nice. It's terrible. It's <laughs> the second time I've done that. I'm and more. Yeah, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think I agree with that little mention that fact should be uh, looked into more. More fact. You but want more fact, Jose? More, I want more fact on screen. Hashtag more fact. Hashtag more fact. There you go. Give us fact. Fuck you. Um, all I'll say now is that this season, right, has <laughs> got to be Kami's journey of redemption to find peace within himself. Ooh, yes. Because almost every other character in season two went on this brilliant arc where they became better as people and at their jobs and just life in general. And they all matured. Mm. Richie, especially, his transformation was a particular highlight for everyone. Loved it. And Loved Kami it. was the only one who managed to fuck it all up. Yeah, but that was that was that, that was important though, wasn't it? Because like. That was the, the flip was like in season one, he was the one that was like dragging him up and he was the one that had his shit together. And then all of a sudden, like it's they're like, at his level thing. now or above. Yeah. So, so now he's, so he's now got to like bring it. So like season three is just, it's going to be Kami being put through the ringer a lot more, man. 
Oh yeah. I can't remember. Do we do we mention? Do we think if John Berenthal is going to be more in the flashbacks? Well, I mean, yeah, because he's he's there and he's it's a flashback, so you can liberally. There'll be, use there'll be a Christmas it. episode. There's going to be a, 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 a very. <laughs> and they, I, I imagine that Tom Cruise will be in it, judging by how fucking how like how star studded they're getting. Oh yeah. Yeah, just he'll be Actually, he'll be the vicar. But also, who are they going to put? Who's going to be in that flashback episode? I mean, you had like you had um, Better Call Souls. Right. Uh, so if we go along those lines, Brian Cranston. To keep it nice, <laughs> that would be fucking brilliant. That and that fits so well. Yeah. He could be like a cantankerous like grandfather or uncle or something. That'd be fucking awesome. Jamie Lee Curtis, so uh, Nev Campbell. So you've got a scream queen in there. Oh, okay, that's Ooh. nice. So not Courtney Cox then. Well, nah, nah. she was a side character. Just side, yeah. Gail uh, Weathers. I don't know. Um, yeah. thinking on my feet. Thinking on my feet. Um, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they get the uh, a very big athlete from Chicago. Because it's based in Chicago, I wouldn't be surprised if they get an athlete in. Grab there. anyone oh. from the current cast of Saturday Night Live to put in there. Ooh, yeah, yeah. John, oh, John okay. Blaney last time, who was what, like one of the writers of it, wasn't he? So uh, that'll do. He was pretty good in his little part, little piece. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good fair like set, like set of people that we've uh, we've offered them. You know, so we'll expect our royalty checks when uh, when they get cast. I will take twenty percent. <laughs> I'm happy with that. You should be happy. You're with you you're too. a benevolent leader. Yeah. Overlord, I prefer Overlord. My, my mistake. Though, well, though. and now this brings us to the coveted We Needy Roads overall combined list. And you'll be thankful to know, everyone, you guys included, we only have one tie in this list this year, which is at number hey. 10. And at number 10, it is Invincible Season 2 Part 2 and Squid Game Season 2. There we go. At number nine, our first Star Wars, spoiler, Skeleton Crew. At number eight, our second Star Wars, The Bad Batch Final Season. At number seven, no sweeping the leg today. It's Cobra Kai's final season. At number Put him six, in a body bag. At number six, people who've definitely sent a lot of body bags. Severance season two, if it comes out. Oh, this I year. forgot about that. Oh, what? Are we... No, that was bad. And at number five, the highest placed new show on our list this year that I'll ever see yet to see, Fallout. Interesting. Yeah. Number four, House of the Dragon season two, not higher. Hello, House of the Dragon. How can I place a call? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'd like that now. And at number three, we have Star Trek Strange New World Season 3. At number two, we have The Bear Season 3. And at number one, The Boys Season 4, which we know is definitely coming out. And there's big question marks over The Bear Season 3, Strange New World Season 3, Severance Season 2. But that's it. There's only three. So there's only three. Just, just give us the bear. Give us the bear. Just give it share the, the bear. Hashtag need... share the bear. Hashtag share the bear. Right. Well, before we before we go, gentlemen, we have comments. We have listener comments. And as usual, first up, we have Marie from Two Girls from Musical Cup. Oh, Yay. by the way, we, we asked people what shows they were most interested in. And sadly, Marie agreed with David. Bridgerton, season three for a good <laughs> cheesy romance. That's a... Don't be so mean to Marie. Just because yeah, she's I got apologize. just be just because she has to, she shares something with David doesn't mean you should condemn her like that. I know, I'm sorry. Well, I apologise. But she also has Umbrella Academy on there for a fun time and some laughs. Oh. And, yeah, yeah, Umbrella good. Academy. Is that coming out? Oh, uh, well, it should be. It's been like how many... Umbrella Academy is a really weird one for me because I binge it whenever it comes out and then it's instantly forgettable. Like yeah. nothing makes... It's just one of these shows that you watch it, you go, oh yeah, I'm enjoying this. It's good. It's an... And then it's completely gone from my brain. The second I'll be I honest, the first, the first season was great. The second season was fine. And then the third season didn't... T- did taper off a little for me because it just didn't end well. You reminded me of you reminded me of the later seasons of Sliders where they've got less budget and they just stick everyone in the same room all the time. In fact, yeah, that's it's very yes. that's one of your favorite. That's one of your go tos. Whenever old, something jumps a shark, you're just like, oh, it's just like that fucking uh, uh, that season of Sliders. So next up, we have uh, Haley at Haley underscore Films says the rookie season six. Well done last week tonight season eleven. So I got that completely wrong earlier on in the uh, in the show. <laughs> Squid Game Season 2, to name a few. I think she's got excellent taste there. Well done, Hayley. Excellent. And the Gentle Dorks podcast said, looking forward to Shogun. Can't wait to see it. Agreed. And then we've got Nick Van Dyke, uh, Agatha, Dark Hole Diaries. Then he's got LOL, not really. The only answer is Industry Season 3. <laughs> it's the absolute best show on TV. I've not actually seen any of Industry. It's a BBC show, isn't it? I've never it? even yeah, heard of it. It's on HBO in the States. I think it was on BBC Two here. And it's all, it's like, it's a bit like, I don't know, because I haven't seen it. But um, hey, we've been recommended it, so I guess I should check out an episode. Also, can we explain that Nick Van, it's D-I-J-I-K. Well, it's Van Dyke. 
because he spelt this. It... So I know Nick. Nick is a guy I used to be in the office that I worked in. And then, okay. okay. And so, um, it's a Dutch name. But no, that's not his real name. His name is Nick something else, but he's a big Liverpool fan. So there's a Liverpool player called uh, Virgil van Dyke, and therefore his name is Nick van Dyke. All right. Okay. And also, or, or it could just be that um, he's a fan of Dick van Dyke. I like that one. It could be either. Anyway. Hey, old governor. Oh, no. No, Jose. Well, like rain. Jose, do not start a war. Do not start a war. The next. <laughs> the next. Uh, the next one is from Turns of Phrase at Exceptional Pod. It just says, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Ominous. Do you think yes. they thought it was fine? Do you think? I think, no, I think everybody's maybe. going to think it's just fine. It's just fine. Right. And finally, we have Z1 Pod. And they said, I'm intrigued to see how Fallout turns out. There's a lot of cautious optimism out there for it. Also, The Boys Season 4, Homelander is one of those characters who's a writer's dream. He's fascinatingly chilling. And I should quickly give a shout out to Zed Pod because these guys... They do a romantic zombie comedy podcast about a married couple surviving the zombie apocalypse, and it's nice. really fucking funny. Yeah, um, awesome. I think wow. they're up to season two or three now. So yeah, give Z uh, shout out to the guys at Z Zed One Pod. Zed One Pod. Yeah. Zed One Pod. Well, gentlemen, it's been forty-five minutes shorter than the last one we did. Oh, it's because you got pizza coming. Wow. Oh, I feel I like have I... one fourth less of the person. So, so you mean all the fluff comes from David? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> 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 the man that man has literally phoned it in this this uh this podcast he's literally I'm, phoned it in this episode <laughs> right well that's all the time we have for and normal service will be resuming shortly on hopefully some shorter episodes uh, i'd like to thank ben uh it was absolutely my pleasure uh and i will see you next time jose cheers mates that, that wasn't awkward right <laughs> still want to verge starting an international incident but yeah it's fine <laughs> and uh david david David, any last words? Yes, I liked everything you all said. You're all very clever and my favourite people. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Wow, David's <laughs> really nice all of a sudden. <laughs> and see you next time, folks. We needed roads.